Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to the Stockton Center for National Law at the United States Naval War College and to the next installment of our Stockton series. I'm Lieutenant Colonel John Cherry. I'm the deputy here at the Stockton Center, and I'm also the president of the U.S. Group of the International Society of Military Law and the Law of War. Uh, today's event addresses international law limits to the military presence of activities in outer space. I'd first like to thank the International Society for Military Law and the Law of War for co-sponsoring this, this event today. And a special thanks out, uh, goes out to Alphonse Van Heusen for his leadership and hard work to help make this event happen. Uh, Alphonse is the Assistant Secretary General uh, for the International Society and we really do appreciate his help. In the months to come, the Stockton Centers will have other series on gender and armed conflict. Uh, in May, we will host our annual Alexander Cushing Conference, and then in June, we'll have an event covering the Arctic. We'd also ask that you follow us on Twitter and come and visit our Stockton Center website. Uh, we'll post a link in the chat where you can subscribe to our mailing list for updates on future events. And I'd like to now introduce Professor James Kraska, who's the chairman and the Charles H. Stockton Professor of International Law at the Stockton Center for International Law. Professor Kraska. Thanks, Colonel Cherry, and welcome everybody to uh, this month's Stockton Seminar. We're going to look at outer space and military activities and operations. And we're especially pleased to be partnering with the International Society for Military Law and the Law of War. And we welcome, in particular, Professor uh, Wolf von Heinig, who is a former Stockton chair at the Naval War College. He was here for two years and part of our extended family. And we also are pleased to uh, be able to partner with Professor Jeff Biller at the uh, US Air Force Cyber Works at the Air Force Academy, who is a former professor in the Stockton Center. And also one of our panelists is uh, uh, Professor Kieran Tinkler, squadron leader from the Royal Air Force, who is a current professor in the Stockton Center. So in the Stockton Center, we focus on three different areas of effort or lines of inquiry. The first is the law of the sea and the law of naval warfare. The second is the law of land warfare, the law of armed conflict and international humanitarian law. And the third is the law of airspace, outer space and cyberspace. And so our program today is brought to you by our our third line of effort or associate directorship, uh, focusing now on outer space. And with that, we'll preserve all the time for our panelists. We have two panels and fantastic speakers, and I'll pitch it back to you, John Cherry. Thank you. Thank you much, much for those comments, we appreciate it. Uh, and like Professor Kraska said, we want to leave as much time as possible for our panelists. So. Uh, I would like to introduce our first uh, chair or moderator for the day, Professor Jeff Biller. Jeff is an assistant professor of cyber law and policy with the Air Force Cyber Works at the United States Air Force Academy. And without further ado, Jeff, please take it away. Thank you very much, Colonel Cherry. Um, the timing of this uh, presentation is, is actually excellent because it gives me an opportunity uh, very briefly to uh, advertise our upcoming conference um, that we have at the U.S. Air Force Academy, where we are partnering with United States Space Command um, to develop and present uh, Space Command's first legal conference. Uh, so if anybody has attended the Strategic Command or the Cyber Command Legal Conference, it will be very much in those veins. Now, due to con uh, the COVID environment, it will be an all virtual uh, event. Um, and it starts on the 7th of April and runs through the 9th um, with keynote speakers, multi-member panels on specialized topics and guest speakers um, throughout the event. Um, on the final day, participants will have the opportunity to engage in an interactive breakout session concerning um, specific topics. And for those with the appropriate uh, legal clearance, or excuse me, security clearance, there will be a classified briefing um, on the last day in the afternoon. Um, in just a moment, uh, once we get going, I'll post the, the link for the conference um, in the chat um, and also an email if you have any questions. Uh, but now to today's topic. Uh, 
So as outer space becomes increasingly utilized for military purposes and states develop weapons designed for uh, use against space objects, the likelihood that an armed conflict will either extend into outer space or even begin in outer space um, is becoming an increasing possibility. However, the law that would govern such a conflict is anything but settled. And as such, we have assembled a very distinguished panel to discuss several aspects of this problem set. Um, we have squadron leader uh, Kieran Tinkler, who's the associate director for the uh, Law of Coalition Air and Space Warfare at the Stockton Center. He recently served as an advisor to the UK headquarters Air Command on operational law issues. And he's a core expert to the Woomera Manual on the International Law of Military Space Operations. We also have Professor Hitoshi Nasu, who is a professor of international law at the University of Exeter and senior fellow at the Stockton Center for International Law. He is known for his expertise on new technologies and the law of armed conflict. Additionally, we have Professor Lori Blank, a clinical professor of law and director of the International Humanitarian Law Clinic at Emory University School of Law where she works directly with students to provide assistance to international tribunals, non-governmental organizations, and militaries around the world on cutting edge issues of humanitarian law and human rights. She is also a core expert on the Woomera Manual. So our first subtopic um, of the day, the law is, is, as you all know, is generally split uh, between the use ad bellum and the use ad bellum. However, certain in bello principles continue to have applicability after the start of a conflict, and this is no less true in outer space. Um, to discuss what extent use ad bellum customary conditions, namely proportionality, continue to govern targeting decisions during ongoing hostilities, uh, we have squadron leader Kieran Tinkler. I turn it over to you. Thanks, Jeff. So, uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. So, the, the first thing I um, wanted to talk about today is when we think about targeting law, uh, we often obviously jump to the law of armed conflict. Um, but there is, a, there is an additional question when states are thinking about target selection, whether that's in outer space or just, or just generally. And that is to what extent does the use of bellum continue to apply and give rise to restrictions essentially in, in targeting. So there's a number of potential ways to look at this. One of them is to say that um, when you look at, for example, how we label the use of bellum, it's, you know, we often say it's the, the area of international law that governs the recourse to war, um, which obviously suggests that it, it has a sort of very finite um, application. Um, but if you look at sort of scholarly views on this, I would say it's fair to surmise that the majority opinion is that um, the use of bedding continues to have a role um, uh, throughout a conflict. So um, if that's the case, then what you're really thinking about is the customary conditions that, that attach to a right of self-defense, which is necessity and proportionality, and really focusing on, on proportionality. So there are different ways to think about it. One is to say that it doesn't really govern at all and that you would look to, for example, military necessity as a, as a general principle. Um, so, for example, there's some interesting discussion in a, in a UK high court decision. So there was a, a case dealing with the, um, a judicial review of weapons supply to, to Saudi Arabia from the UK. And in that high court decision, there was the suggestion, albeit over to dicta, that um, targeting law is very complex. Um, and you have to think about military necessity, and then it talks about, and also what's the military objective. So the, the inference there is that there's sort of two requirements when you're thinking about what to target from the distinction perspective. You have to comply with a broader principle of military necessity, and you have to comply with um, Article 52.2 and its customer equivalent, so what's the military objective? So quickly, I think that view is wrong. Um, the DoD Law of War Manual takes the right position, in my opinion, that you that when you're looking at targeting objects, um, what is where military necessity resides has been refined and detailed in the test in Article 52.2. So there is no sort of separate requirement for what's um, military necessity above and beyond what's the military objective. Um, there have been discussions, particularly in the context of targeting combatants, whether military necessity. Uh, has a sort of a greater restriction than just safe space targeting. That's something we don't need to go into here. Um, so 
does this question of does military necessity have something above what's a military objective? And it's also a question of use of bell end. Does, does the conditions of necessity and proportionality to, uh, continue to apply? Um, so, so my view is um, something of a middle ground. So I think that the conditions of proportionality under the use of bell end does continue to apply. But when you properly conceive of what that principle demands, then it is not as onerous as, as what as what you, you you might think initially. So what is the what when we think about proportionality in the use of bellum, what are we talking about? The, unfortunately, it's not. Um, there's a lot of disagreement. So there's kind of there's at least three ways to think about proportionality under the use of bellum. Um, probably the two main ones. One is okay. Well, um, I've just suffered an armed attack, uh, and you've used X amount of force to do it. Therefore, my whatever force I use in self-defense must be commensurate to roughly equivalent amount of force. Um, I think that view is wrong for, for, for multiple reasons. Uh, logically, it's wrong because you may have to use, if someone, for example, were to invade an island or a, a peninsula, the amount of force that you may need to use to regain that could be uh, far in excess of the amount of force that was used to take it if it was lightly defended. Also, uh, it would suggest that proportionality might be more permissive than what you would need to um, to act in self-defense if what you needed was less than the amount of force that you suffered in the first place. So uh, when we think about proportionality, what, uh, in my opinion, what we've, we're talking about is, is my state actions in self-defense, uh, is it justified based on the legitimate aims of self-defense? And that gives rise to the question of what are legitimate aims. So one view is that you are limited to um, acting to halt the ongoing armed attack. Um, and th there's obviously some room in between, but at the other end of the spectrum, there's the view that you basically can carry the war through to essentially an annihilating the enemy. Um, and <clears throat> that, you know, that's a kind of... That's if you look at it the way you pick one, uh, and there's been some interesting discussion recently. Uh, David Kretzmer, for example, and, and I, I'm a fan of this opinion. That if you suffer um, a small scale sort of armed attack, it, it trips over that threshold. So it's not just a use of force; it's an armed attack, but it's relatively minor. In that case, um, I think that you, the the legitimate aims of self defence, which again is linked to proportionality, so how much how much force can I use? legitimately to respond to that, that that is limited to sort of uh, halting the ongoing uh, small incident. Uh, if, it, if the act that you're defending against is sufficiently um, large, then proportionality allows you to both uh, halt and repel the attack and deal with reasonably expected um, future attacks um, based on the, the totality of the circumstances. So applying that to space, why this matters um, if you were to say, for example, that proportionality has to be um, commensurate, um, so a calculation of you, you use X amount of force, so you can only use Y in response, uh, that could mean that you are limited in terms of targeting um, ground stations or satellites. Um, perhaps more importantly, um, when you're talking about this, you could there's a suggestion by people like Christopher Greenwood that um, if you were to bring the fight to a new domain, to a new geographical area, so here we're thinking about space, then that would be a disproportionate response and, and therefore would be prohibited under the use of Bella. So that could have, and to me that that misunder, that kind of view misunderstands what warfare is, certainly in the 21st century. So we talk about joint operations, we talk about multi-domain warfare. There's such a great interconnectedness between cyber, land, space, uh, the maritime domain, the air domain, to arbitrarily deny a state's ability to target things in different domains based on something like proportionality to use in Bellum, to me misunderstands both what the rule requires and warfare itself. So with that, I'll, um, I'll hand back over to Jeff. Great, thank you. And um, before we continue on with the discussion, I just wanted to make sure that uh, everybody, all the participants or panel or uh, participants in the the conference, know that we do have the question and answer. Uh, please, as we go along, throw your questions in there, um, and uh, we will get to them as we are able to do so. Um, so, thank you for that opening, um, Squadron Leader Tinkler. Uh, really interesting topic. Um, one question: So you addressed. 
um, the argument that it should not be uh, extended into this new domain, but might there be uh, certain limits on how it can be extended um, given the nature of the space domain? So I'm thinking, is it possible that you um, there, there, there could be a limit on what you could do in the space domain, such as using temporary and reversible effects um, as opposed to kinetic means as part of that proportionality analysis? So I think, thanks, Joe. So I think what you're driving at there is kind of um, mitigation of, of sort of the, the amount of force you use, uh, which is, I guess, is an interesting question uh, from, from a use of Bellum perspective. But really, use of Bellum, you're talking about necessity. So is there no other option than using force in circumstances to, to, you know, for the state to defend itself? Uh, and then secondly, how much force can I, uh, is, um, how much force can I, can I use? And is it, uh, is it reasonable based on on the on the actual object that I, I'm looking to achieve? Uh, and as I mentioned, I think it can kind of be a bit of a sliding scale. Um, there's, there's a perfectly reasonable argument that if uh, if you could do something to achieve a self-defense objective and and use uh, less force than you're doing, then you can argue that's not necessary. However, um, that depends on what you think necessity is, um, which to me is just a gateway to whether you use force in the first place. But people take different views on that. I don't know if Hitoshi or I've got a different opinion. So I'm, I think I'm with you. Um, I think the question uh, uh, Jeff uh, posed is, is, is essentially a question under Usain Bello. So um, uh, in terms of those questions about the amount of uh, force you can use to target a particular military objective uh, in space um, uh, and other uh, alternative uh, methods to be considered, uh, that's an a, um, obvious application of uh, proportionality and uh, a duty to exercise uh, physical precautions. So those uh, obligations under traditional uh, law of armed conflict would guide and would control such decisions, in my view. Professor Blank, did you have anything you'd like to add? I just want to add, um the any time as as um, Karen was saying, when we add a new domain um, into the equation, right, we start to have questions about the very um, breadth to which the principles we've been thinking about in one, let's call it area for to not use the word domain, um, what that means. And one of the tricky things I think about space is the fact that it is, in fact, so far away. Right now, that may seem quite simplistic, but it's the attenuation from where we envision the conflict to be taking place that sometimes can trip up the conversation in terms of thinking about necessity or proportionality. In other words, it, it, it can take a bit um, of thinking through, right, and grasping the actual intricate connection between what's happening in space and the military operations that we actually can see on the ground or in the air or at sea in order to then think through necessity and proportionality correctly. And so you can see a knee jerk reaction sometimes that, well, taking out that satellite can't have been proportionate, right? Because here's where the conflict is happening, right? And so, you know, this is an example like so many other examples when we talk about use ad bellum and use in bella where where the operational context and understanding it matters and not thinking things you know not sort of uh taking too uh either i get theoretical or just abstract a view of what the concepts mean and so um it might seem to someone that neutralizing or even destroying a particular space capability seems over the top, right? Um, meaning outside the bounds of use ad bellum proportionality in a particular context. Um, but that's it, not necessarily the case, right? It very much depends on context. Another challenging piece here, I think that comes up, um, will come up across our conversation is the fact that, um, a lot of space capabilities may not be something that a state wants to share. How they know 
the way a particular capability is impacting the adversary's ability to do something. And so we end up with what is not a new challenge for the state that is taking a particular action, which is how do you explain and justify your action in a way that would satisfy external observers and yet not cause you to share information you don't feel like sharing. Um, that's obviously a huge issue when it comes to use in Velo um, as well. So just a couple of thoughts there. Yeah, and I think Laurie raises a great point. And, and an example would be, um, you know, if you need to achieve your um, self-defense objectives, so let's, let's, let's say take it back, you've been invaded somewhere, you need to send your Navy there, right? Um, if satellites have been put up in space for the very purpose of tracking maritime vessels to enable targeting, right? That is, that is a key aspect of what you might want to counter before you send your Navy. So, you know, just saying, well, hang on, it took place over here. It's, it looks like it's fairly small. Why are you targeting this? Whether it's, you know, jamming or, 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 or more kinetic activity, you know, it's too simplistic just to say, hey, um, like Laurie said, you know, you need to, need to restrict your geographic um, ability to target. All right. I think another uh, interesting question that often comes up um, uh, in the use ad bellum context uh, when it comes to to outer space is the question of anticipatory self defense um, and aggressive satellite maneuvers. So we've seen certain states developing the capability um, to use um, satellites um, in an aggressive means, sometimes for espionage purposes, but potentially also um, for purposes of affecting the the uh, ability of that satellite to operate or even cause some sort of kinetic uh, effect against that satellite. Um, I was just wondering if, if, if any of our panelists had any thoughts on kind of the development of determining those hostile intent or hostile act questions as it relates to the the use ad bellum question of self-defense in outer space. So, I mean, one of the things, Jeff, that I, is going to be important here is um, at the moment in space, there isn't a kind of loosely agreed, you know, what's what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. So people in, in this kind of uh, international relations and space arena at the moment often talk about norms and, you know, non-binding um, ideas of behavior because this feeds very much into, am I, you know, is there an imminent armed attack coming? Because if you, if, for example, in 10 years time, we recognize that um, unless, you know, your, your predicted orbit is, is gonna come close to my satellite, Unless that's the case, if you come within, let's say, something arbitrary, five kilometers, 20 kilometers, depending on what um, orbit you're talking about. If you come within that, you know, that's not normal. Therefore, I'm already on high alert of what's happening. Uh, it'll also depend on the on the um, continued activity. So if there's an increase in the amount of satellites that um, are used as inspectors, whether that's in GEO or, or, or other satellites, so, you know, passively um, collecting intelligence, for example, then that sort of behavior becomes more, more normal and therefore you, you're gonna be less inclined to sort of jump ahead with your analysis of is there an imminent threat or not. Um, so there's a long way to go in terms of being able to um, paint a picture that gives you that, that impression. It's, it's very contextual. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into um, it. Um, Laurie, I don't know if you wanna jump in. I think, Kieran, you're right. Um, I think it comes down to the factual assessment uh, by the government uh, under the attendant circumstances. Uh, and um, uh, as um, uh, you also rightly pointed out, uh, there are many uh, sort of different uh, testings and experiments that are taking place in space. So uh, that makes uh, that assessment uh, particularly uh, challenging. Uh, and uh, that also increases the, perhaps the risk of misperception and miscalculation uh, among the space power uh, or space theory nations. So that would be a concern, but um, uh, the states would uh, behave uh, in a manner that would be reasonable under the circumstances. And as long as they can uh, find uh, ground for justifying their action, they would do so. Uh, 
Uh, so, um, um, yes, it comes down to the factual assessment. It's very difficult to actually say or predict under what sort of circumstances the state would be justified in launching a, a preemptive or uh, anticipatory uh, self-defense action uh, in abstract. Yeah, I think one of the challenges here is we're now talking about um, every piece of this question has debate and uncertainty involved in it. There's no agreement about what imminent means when it comes to imminent armed attack. Um, is it literally, you know, the planes, the equivalent of the planes are en route, or is it we know they're about to attack, right? There's a variety of conceptions or defi definition would be too strong a word there. Um, interpretations of imminent. And now that's hard enough, again, in the earthly domain, but now add into space that we don't have a sense um, of exactly what constitutes a use of force or an armed attack. Um, we have good ideas, but until essentially the rubber meets the road, we don't actually know um, what states will think. And then um, we can also imagine circumstance where, um, whether it's, Jeff, what you're talking about, um, you know, aggressive satellite move maneuvering and RPO, or maybe it's more of a cyber intrusion and it's unclear what the extent of that intrusion is. Is that going to interfere with a satellite or other space objects functioning? Is it gonna temporarily disable it? Are you unsure and you think maybe it's gonna permanently disable it? Um, you don't know. So now how do you consider both whether it's pushing above the threshold to trigger self-defense and when it's imminent, right? Is, is a temporary disabling of something that we wouldn't consider to be an armed attack. Let's imagine we don't consider temporary loss of functionality to be an armed attack. Is that actually a sign of an imminent permanent loss of functionality in essence, right? So essentially we're, we're jumbling up the puzzle pieces completely, but I think that's one of the challenges. Um, one of the ways we solve these things ordinarily is state practice and the way both states act and other states respond. We don't have a lot of state practice yet in this respect. It's unclear what will come. Um, let's hope there's not a lot of state practice in this regard, given what can be the extremely widespread consequences of these types of actions. But in the absence of it, there's a lot of unpredictability for states in terms of how will my, you know, putative adversary respond to my conduct. I think what I'm doing is staying within a certain set of boundaries, but maybe they're going to consider it a use of force or even an imminent armed attack. I better be able to predict how they're going to view what I'm doing, right? And vice versa. And um, that's, that's um, certainly a tricky piece here. Hey, Jeff, I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was muted. Um, all right, let's move on to our second topic now. Um, as, as Richard Baxter has stated, the first line of defense against the use in Bellow is to deny that it applies at all. And this has been a big debate um, in the area of, of space law is the applicability of the use in Bellow. And here to introduce that topic is Professor Nasu. Thank you, Jeff. So um, I think uh, for uh, many of us um, uh, uh, attending um, this workshop or seminar, it will be obvious that law of armed conflict or uh, international humanitarian law, if you uh, want to call it, will apply um, uh, to space operations in situations of armed conflict. Uh, that's an obvious statement and preposition. But there are certain uh, questions that may be posed. So I thought I should perhaps explain uh, two reasons why uh, this fundamental um, um, proposition may be questioned uh, by some uh, people. 
The first um, uh, reason is more of a political uh, reason. Um, there are certain states that are reluctant to accept the view that the uh, armed conflicts could be engaged in space. Uh, the uh, talking about the application of law of armed conflict in space would signal the acceptance uh, of the a possibility that the uh, space uh, domain can be exploited uh, for uh, a military engagement uh, and the engagement with uh, host in engagement with armed conflict. So there is some reluctance um, for political reasons uh, um, uh, because of it. And also there is some sort of um, um, belief or uh, aspirational um, um, sort of statement uh, as you can find in the preamble uh, to the Outer Space Treaty, that the space activities should be reserved for peaceful purposes. Uh, obviously, there's a question and a big debate about what we actually mean by peaceful uh, in this context. Uh, but certainly that sort of aspirational statement is also adding uh, some flavor to this uh, 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 view, uh, which is politically motivated. The other reason is some uh, perhaps some uh, a little bit more important, uh, and it's about the legal technicality. Um, so um, um, it's not that simple to say that the law of armed conflict applies in space. Uh, we have to look at the actual specific rules uh, to see which rules of international uh, law actually apply in space. And uh, there are certain rules, traditional rules of law of armed conflict, which are considered as domain specific. The development of those, those rules were uh, uh, taking place in the specific uh, uh, context, for example, uh, in the maritime context or in the land context. So if you look at the many of the Hague uh, conventions of 1907, and many of them are dedicated to a certain domains of hostilities. So those rules, domain-specific rules, may not find uh, application, uh, automatic application, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the space activities um, or the conduct of hostilities taking place in space. So um, um, uh, we have to look at which rules of international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflict actually do have application uh, when it comes to the engagement with the armed conflict uh, in space. And also there is a technical question about uh, additional protocol one. Well, the UN, United States doesn't have to worry about this because you're not party to it. Um, but for those other states that are party to additional protocol one, uh, then there's a, a, a sort of a, a qualifying clause, some uh, article 49, paragraph three, uh, which sort of a, um, um, indicates the possibility that uh, this legal regime, which is basically targeting rules, um, may not uh, be considered as having an application uh, in other domains uh, because um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, law of, uh, the, the law of armed conflict that applies in the sea and air are uh, explicitly excluded from the application of this particular legal regime. Now, um, it's a treaty interpretation question. Uh, there are different views about it. Um, um, and uh, um, many would say that, well, it's only designed to uh, um, uh, preclude uh, this legal regime uh, making some changes to the existing rules uh, of law of armed conflict that have applied in the, in the maritime or air context. Uh, and it doesn't, it wasn't designed to exclude its op application in other domains like space or cyber. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, the, uh, there is uh, some open question about the interpretation of this particular clause. So it comes down to the actual interpretation of uh, individual treaty and treaty obligations. And we have to assess each one of those in deciding which uh, rules of law of armed conflict would have an application uh, when it comes to the um, uh, conduct of hostilities in space. Thank you. Um, so one question I have, I think, on, on that last point that you made is people often raise the Lotus principle, uh, right, in this regard, that because there has not been any specific uh, treaty or customary law to suggest 
the extension of the law of armed conflict or the use in bellow into outer space um, then under the Lotus principle, then it has not done so. Um, so I, I know that uh, there's been a number of, of retorts to that position. Um, do you have kind of a summary of those responses or, or one of your own? Well, I don't have any summary of responses, but I'm a huge fan of Lotus principle, I can say. Uh, but one uh, difficulty, though, uh, in the space domain is that it's not completely void of legal uh, regime. Uh, we, I think in the next session, uh, the experts uh, uh, will talk about application of space law. Uh, and uh, um, uh, there are uh, several uh, treaties that are concluded specifically dealing with space activities. So um, uh, even in uh, the situations of armed conflict, some of those obligations may continue to bind uh, states, uh, even those engaging in the conduct of hostilities. So um, uh, uh, yes, I'm a huge fan of uh, Lotus principle, uh, but we have to acknowledge that there are actually a legal regime that is put in place uh, specifically for regulating the activities uh, in outer space. And there is a, a need to, uh, to reconcile uh, competing uh, legal obligations uh, that may arise under two uh, two different legal regimes. And, and I'll open this up to any of the panelists, but one of the arguments has been that the Outer Space Treaty explicitly states that international law applies in outer space. Does this incorporate the use uh, in Bello into that statement and overcome maybe some of those Lotus Principle objections? So, I mean, it helps. Article three certainly helps. Um, I think it's actually wrong to, to pin your pin your hat on Article three. I don't think you need to because um, although that is one way to get there, because law of armed conflict is is <clears throat> post nineteen um, forty nine is supposed to be an objective factual assessment. It's not supposed to be when you know, for example, when states declare war. Um, so factually, if you have um, what amounts to an armed conflict, then the law of armed conflict applies. I don't think you need to, to um, get there by a space, although obviously it's helpful even if it doesn't expressly state law of armed conflict. Or if to the UN Charter, you know, we've seen in ICJ jurisprudence, they talk about how intertwined use of Bellum, use and Bellow is. It would be incongruent to suggest that LOAC doesn't also apply via Article 3. But I don't think you need to use it to get there. And as Satoshi talked about, the, the kind of, for me, the core issue is not so much does the whole body of law apply is what parts of LOAC apply? Um, and I think it's too simplistic to say, well, the Hague regulations talk about land law, therefore they're irrelevant. Well, one, they're customary, and two, at least one of the provisions was deliberately worded to apply, to apply them to air warfare. And if you look at the wording, it would actually apply to space warfare, it's so broadly worded. So it's more a case of what parts do I need to apply, not does LOAC apply at all? Another, um, or I guess, yeah, another piece of this is a lot of when we, what we talk about in terms of the application of LOAC to military operations in space is intimately connected to operations on the ground. And to suggest that LOAC is applying to an armed conflict taking place, um, again, in the earthly space, so including air, land, sea, um, and that you have an operation um, that is going to have an impact in that, those areas, but some part of it takes place in space. I think it is fundamentally at odds with our basic notion of what LOAC is all about to say that, oh, well, if you're able to do this through space, well, we're gonna close our eyes while you're doing that. The law is not gonna worry about as soon as you leave the atmosphere until the time you come back in. So turns off, I mean, that's just absolutely fundamentally at odds with how we would expect um, LOAC to apply. Um, you wouldn't say that about, you know, launching a munition that might transit over, um, you know, some other portion, some other state or something like that. So um, that that's one piece. And it's obviously not then from there a big step to get to well, if that's the case, then how could we say that if you're engaging in a conflict entirely in outer space, um, that again, that's a, a tool for states to evade obligations. So it, it partly depends on your perspective in 
what you think, uh, where you start in thinking about LOAC. Um, but I, I think um, given the consequences um, for multiple civilian populations, let alone the those who are actually engaged in the fighting, um, to suggest that somehow it's a it's a free zone um, is highly problematic. Um, and you know, let's not forget um, you know customary law as well, which. Again, when we think about the particular treaty provisions that um, Hitoshi and Kieran have already mentioned, um, it is true that there there is specific treaty language in AP1, but the targeting rules in AP1 are generally well accepted as customary law. Um, I just think it's a stretch to to argue there is a conflict going on. Oh, but look, I get to go over here and not follow any rules. Right. We, we've seen that story in the context of terrorism, in the context of other things over the last 20 years, and it never goes well. Yeah, very good point. And but it does kind of raise. So in addition to the general applicability of the use in Bello, um, we still have our, our other space treaties. And one of the questions that, that is often raised is what's the interplay between uh, the outer space treaties and other uh, treaties specifically about space um, and the use in Bello, should we enter into some sort of armed conflict where um, militaries operating in space um, are, are parties to a conflict? Um, so does anybody have any thoughts on that, that general question of, is the use in Bello going to be the Lex Specialis for space to the complete exclusion of the Outer Space Treaty? Um, are there provisions of the Outer Space Treaty um, and other treaties that will continue to apply um, and, and how we should conduct the analysis there? So that's the topic um, uh, Kieran and I uh, often talk about um, um, over this online remote drinking party um, every second week or so, I think we are having. Um, so um, uh, it's, um, um, there is no sort of a straightforward answer to that. You have to, as I said, you have to look at each individual rules uh, and see how it works. For example, uh, the treaty obligations that are uh, that the state accepts uh, as a sort of a general objective obligation uh, towards uh, you know, uh, a number of other states uh, universally, uh, then obviously those obligations would continue to apply. Uh, so for example, uh, the freedom of use uh, in, of space uh, or um, the um, um, obligations to exercise sort of a national responsibility for space activities those obligations the states owe towards all the other states, not just with respect to the state you are engaging uh, with uh, in hostilities with. So those obligations some um, obviously continue to apply. On the other hand, if you pick the uh, obligations that are more of a reciprocal in nature, uh, for example, um, the obligation to consult uh, if you want to interfere or if you expect that there will be harmful interference with the space, space, space activities of another state, or uh, they paying a compensation for the damage that, has, that is caused by your own space activities. Uh, those obligations, of course, in situations of armed conflict, you intend to cause problems, you intend to cause interference, you intend to cause damage. That's what you are doing in a situation around conflict. So it'll be bizarre and obviously uh, um, uh, uh, flawed uh, if you argued that those obligations would also continue to apply in situations of armed conflict. So those two, um, um, uh, obligations would cease to operate uh, even though the um, actual treaty itself may still in, uh, remain intact but uh, its operation uh, ceases to operate uh, with respect to the conduct of hostilities uh, and to that extent uh, to the extent that it's not compatible uh, with the conduct of hostilities. But Kieran can join us because join me, join me um, uh, adding more comments because um, we um, uh, uh, talk a lot about this of a drink or, or remote drinking. 
So let me throw out a couple of examples because I think there actually are some really interesting questions that come up um, in specific situations um, that that can help advance the the it, you know thinking process that Hitoshi um, presented to us, which is sort of trying to come up with a way. Um, a methodology to think through some of these interactions. So for example, um, imagine that in the course of a, of a conflict, um, there's an armed conflict going on between two states and uh, the space object of one of those states um, returns to earth involuntarily <laughs> um, by any variety of, for any variety of causes. And it happens to um, return to Earth on the territory of the adversary state. So under international space law, the rescue and return agreement, there is an obligation that when a space object arrives unexpectedly, you know, on your territory or in your waters or in an area where you're able to assist with that, you're obligated to assist with the recovery and return of that space object. Okay, that's, that's one, one analytical piece. Well, in armed conflict, if you gain possession of part of the adversary's military uh, equipment, arsenal, et cetera, that's yours, right? Um, war booty, any number of ways to think about that. So which is it, right? In the middle of an armed conflict, a military satellite or other space object appears on your territory, right? Involuntarily, in involuntarily leaves space. Um, it seems to me that it is inconceivable that the adversary would say, oh yes, I must abide by the rescue and return uh, agreement and give you back your military satellite in the middle of our armed conflict. It, it, it's, it's not gonna happen. The LOAC rule is going to provide the applicable guidance there. Interestingly, what would happen at the end? Right? Would all of a sudden, when the conflict is over, space law would be like, "Okay, now I apply. Let's see what happens." Right? So that's that's one example. Another interesting one is military astronauts. Right? International space law says that astronauts are envoys of mankind, um, and they have a variety of protections, obligations for states, how to protect them, and so on. There's an armed conflict going on, and that astronaut is a member of the uniformed military of a state involved in that conflict. Are they a combatant? Are they a lawful target at all times as a result? Um, it seems there's certainly no provision in LOAC to say, oh, a military astronaut, that's the one person in the regular armed forces who is not a combatant. I mean, we didn't, we didn't have that issue when the treaties were being drafted. Um, but that's been, you know, that, that has produced some really inter interesting discussions as well. Um, in particularly in the context of, is that person a lawful target at all times, or does it depend on what they're doing? Are they doing scientific research? Um, in which case maybe we consider them, uh, certainly entitled to POW status, but maybe, maybe we're not comfortable with the targeting concept. And then what does that mean for LOAC? But if we say lawful target at all times, what does that mean for envoys of mankind, right? That one's a little harder to parse out than the rescue and return of the object. So I just, I throw those out as, you know, just examples that can help or at least identify ways we need to keep thinking about this. Yeah, I'd, I'd, sorry, Dave, I just had sort of th three things. Um, so hopefully no one has to advise on this for real, but if you do, <clears throat> the kind of, for me, there's three big things to think about. One is, does the actual space or provision, is it, um, is it applicable now? Because, you know, Hitoshi mentioned about it's potentially harmful interference and the obligation to consult. It says appropriate. Now, if I was a state that's belligerent, I would say it's inappropriate for me to, to, to tip my hat on targeting in space. Therefore, I would argue that provision is inapplicable. As a, as a matter of law. The second thing, as Laurie referred to, is conflicting norms. You know, these, these are opposite. So um, the rescue and return agreement, 
talks about personal of a spacecraft having to be returned to their to the to the launching authority basically if they uh, if they happen to land on your territory loat would suggest that you can inter you can in basically intern them um, and then you can get into really granular sort of discussion well one is an obligation one's a right does that mean it's a conflict we won't get into that but then the third one is um you know the liability convention is a good example of this these two norms are not in conflict but one of them seems to be inconsistent with a state of, um, of belligerency. And so there's sort of three different things to think about. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, I mean, these are all fantastic points. And I'll just add that I do understand the reluctance, particularly on certain states, to extend the use in Bellow into space, because there's no doubt that it does provide a positive authority to use violence. Um, and the, the, the understanding of the space domain um, and the use of violence in the space domain, there, there are significant concerns. Um, and I do know that a number of states have been very reluctant to expressly uh, extend um, that. To what extent that affects the, the opinion juris um, and customary law as to questions about extension, um, you know, very much an open question. Um, but, but I think it's one of those topics that the deeper you dive into it, the more interesting it gets, even if you might on the surface think that it's a relatively simple question. Um, uh, we did have one question that I think really segues nicely. And, and by the way, if we don't get to your questions during that that kind of subtopic, we will bring them up at the at the end. So please keep adding those questions to the Q and A. Um, but one of the questions r related to applic applicability of LOAC in outer space, given that most of LOAC is, um, or at least much of LOAC is, is focused on the prevention of human suffering, and at least as of now, this could obviously change, but as of now, there's fairly limited um human presence in, in outer space and so how that might affect the the extension but it's a great segue into our our, our next topic which is really about the uh, application of targeting law um to to outer space so once applicability has been determined um how targeting laws or the rest of use in bella might actually apply in space presents uh, many additional challenges and questions, particularly as it relates to the protection of civilians. Um, and to, to kind of uh, provide an opening into that topic, we have Professor Blank. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, the question actually uh, is, a, is, a, is a perfect uh, tip off for um, a couple of points that I want to raise to introduce this issue. As the question notes, um, protection of civilians is, of course, a core purpose of the law of armed conflict. Protection of civilians has also been a dominant theme operationally in military operations over the past few decades. And this is 100% appropriate, obviously. Much of that discussion, both in terms of how the law applies, but also in terms of how do you carry out the law's obligations? How do you carry out the law's goals um, as a practical matter? Um, has focused over the last certainly few decades on urban warfare, on densely populated areas and similar situations. Obviously, those scenarios pose enormous risk for civilians. So, you know, I think as the question asked, when we start thinking about military operations in outer space, it feels at first like, whew, we've got a little bit of a respite, right, from the high intensity civilian protection issues that we have been so deeply immersed in, because again, outer space is really, really, really far away um, from any areas with a lot of civilians. However, um, space presents a number of really interesting issues or complications in terms of applying targeting laws with respect to this specific goal of protecting civilians. Because even though it's really far away, um, it's like it's like right here, right? You have a phone, you have GPS. Guess what? Space is in your pocket basically all the time. Um, so so it's an interesting juxtaposition of intimate involvement in civilian infrastructure and life, and yet, you know, incredibly far away. Um, anytime we think about the application of targeting law um, to any situation, it inherently requires a deep understanding of civilian infrastructure, civilian population patterns, the effects of any actions on those 
So now we have to be able to take that understanding, our ideas of a pattern of life assessment that we're so accustomed to now, um, and begin to take that and I guess zoom out right into the outer space scenario. Um, so space affects a lot of how we think about in terms of applying those core principles of distinction, proportionality, and precautions. Um, so for example, um, what is a civilian object, right? Um, what's a military objective? So many space objects have military uses that we actually need to think in a very discerning manner to ensure protection for objects that don't meet the definition of a military objective. Um, we also need to recognize that states may feel that they have a fair amount of leeway in asserting characterizations that objects are military objectives given either military use or potential military use. Uh, because almost anything in space um, can have a military use. Uh, we spent some time with a couple of colleagues on the Woomer Manual once trying to come up with an example for the purpose of illustrating a particular issue we were trying to come up with an example of an object in space that had no military use. And the best we could come up with was the Tesla that Elon Musk sent out into space. Although theoretically, if you could control it once it's out there, you can ram it into something, right? It's almost impossible to come up with something where you can say absolutely no military use. Um, and so, what does it mean to have these overlapping civilian and military uses um, when you have multiple payloads on one satellite? What does that mean for the definition of military objective? Um, and we get to this question of severability in terms of understanding what is the military objective and sort of where's the line when it's intimately connected to other things. We think about that sometimes with buildings. Um, is it the room? the bad guy is in? Is it the entire building? Is it the wing of the building? Um, how might we think about that? Well, that's becomes significantly more complicated when you have a satellite on a, you know, on a payload on a satellite bus, and there's several other payloads on there, and they belong to different countries. And those countries are not involved in the conflict, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, right, we can make that as complicated as we want. So that's one issue. Another one that I think is equally interesting and challenging is what does civilian harm mean, right? We are pretty quick um, when we think about proportionality and the use in bellow to say, oh, what's the civilian side of the equation? You know, civilian death, injury, or destruction of civilian property. That's, that's sort of, you know, the automatic. There's a lot of questions about how far that goes in second and third order effects on land um, and so forth, but it's then greatly magnified when we think about space because space objects provide services to civilians in many, if not all countries around the world. Um, that means that actions taken against that space object can potentially cause harm to those civilians in that broad extended area. So, for me, it raises a couple of questions. When we talk about protection of civilians, which civilians do we mean, right? Um, which, what is the civilian population? Is it Earth, <laughs> right? I mean, is it, we, we normally, in, when we're talking about armed conflict, we're thinking about civilians in the areas of the conflict. And sometimes we hear people talk about, you know, our civilians, their civilians. Of course, the law doesn't do that. Civilians are civilians. Um, but when we think about the, the impact of actions taken against space objects, whether it's uh, GPS, whether it's a weather satellite, whether it's a satellite that provides emergency communications for search and rescue, for um, disaster relief, uh, et cetera, maybe with space, we should be thinking a little bit about some kind of concentric circles or other ways to think about different layers of civilian harm so that we can grasp how far that goes. This also gets us thinking about 
what are the reverberating effects that should be included when we think about the type of harm? We normally think about foreseeability in this context, um, but how might that change as technology continues to develop? Uh, space debris is an obvious one that pretty much gets you tangled up in knots every time. Um, because if you destroy a space object and you produce space debris, um, that's going to be there forever. Are you supposed to foresee the potential harm that some of that space degree, debris could cause 40 years down the road? Um, you know, my brain can't process that much. Um, what about if you are attacking a satellite hosting a military SATCOM node and the, that's going to destroy also a civilian transponder um, and it's going to disrupt sat phone service in emergency and disaster areas. How do you understand the extent of that harm and then assess it for purposes of proportionality? So there's some really interesting questions. Who do you warn, right? What does it mean to affect the civilian population so as to trigger the obligation to provide an effective advance warning? These are these are things that are not hard concepts when we think about, we know what the rule is, but we've got to think about lots and lots of examples in outer space to start to understand where we can apply the rule in a meaningful way and where we've got to start thinking about, huh, what does that mean? Um, so I leave it there. I think there's interesting questions about what is civilian property, um, the consequences of you know launching state and um and uh any number of different states that might be involved in space activities but i'll leave it there in terms of um some interesting questions with respect to civil yes thank you as you can tell we decided to focus on easy and very solvable problems here in this panel um and 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 Professor Blank, your comments just got me thinking about um, Starlink and other satellite-based internet services that are proposed to bring um, the internet to over half the world's population, right? So if if over half the world's population's sole connection um, to, to the internet and those services are through space objects, which as you mentioned, are almost certainly going to be utilized in one uh, means or another by militaries, does it at some point is it simply impossible to make that calculation um is it um is it just so overwhelming you know like you you mentioned with the the space debris problem it's hard for the mind to even make that concept when you think about space debris that could be up there for thousands of years how do you even contemplate proportionality um in that context um our other panelists any any thoughts on those comments because certainly they're very thought-provoking Well, I mean, Laurie's raised a lot of very uh, well profound kind of questions for LOAC, and and like she said, you know, a lot of these things that you know when you're doing targeting in a, in a chaos or you know wherever else you, you're sort of advising on, you know, these aren't things you you've had to think about. Um, and you know, Major Zellner, who's in the next panel, gave a presentation yesterday that I'm sort of working my way through. You know, one of, one of the fundamental questions is this this issue of foreseeability. Um, whether you know, and, and in multiple rules of law, I mean, the, the most obvious being proportionality. You know, so uh, what is expected civilian harm? You know, so ignoring the question of what does that encompass in terms of who civilians, you know, how far we're talking about, um, what is expected? Um, and if we talk about foreseeability, you know, a lot of it is can be phrased, in, you know, based on how you phrase the question. Is it foreseeable that if you produce um, space debris that it will hit another satellite? Yes. Um, is it foreseeable that you'll, you know, cause civilian harm as a result? Well, you know, there has to be a lot of sophisticated mapping that goes into that. Um, and, and as we know, you know, there's, there's disagreement amongst um, states and scholars on, on to what extent is foreseeability uh, to be expected. You know, the DoD manual focuses more on direct harm. Um, the UK manual, uh, as it's worded currently, doesn't, doesn't seem to be quite as limiting. But then, you know, like a lot of things, foreseeability can be in the eye of the beholder. So, 
I would add to uh, comment to that. Uh, I uh, absolutely agree with everything that has been said uh, by Kieran and uh, Laurie. Um, the two sort of interesting um, changes that we might expect to see uh, is first the use of uh, artificial intelligence. So um, at the moment, uh, foreseeability, of course, is a huge challenge. Um, we have to think about to what extent the use of artificial intelligence might actually facilitate uh, uh, the militaries and governments in uh, calculating the actual amount of effect or uh, type of harm that may be caused by a single operation. Second um, uh, development we might see is uh, the proliferation of um, uh, satellites me, uh, uh, providing a uh, great amount of resili uh, resilience uh, to um, harms that may be caused to those satellites. So um, uh, yes, there may be some impact, but if there are other redundant uh, systems that are put in place, then uh, perhaps you might expect there won't be any harm that will be caused to civilians. So perhaps in time, perhaps not right now, but in time, the satellites, particularly communication satellites and navigational ones, may become more like undersea cables. Uh, yes, technically speaking, they can be legitimate military targets uh, some, uh, when they satisfy those uh, conditions and requirements as Laurie described, but uh, the actual effect of it may become not so significant uh, from a military perspective. So um, uh, those are the sort of two additional uh, technological uh, developments uh, we might see which also change the way in which we might uh, think about how uh, relevant rules of um, targeting might apply uh, to um, uh, operations against satellites. I just um, oh, want to throw out, if I can, just first want to respond to um, something that Kieran said. You talked about when you're in the CAOC and you're not normally thinking about a lot of these things, um, this far out. Um, these questions, I think, raise um, another set of questions, which is, who does the commander need um, on staff, in essence, to be able to provide some of this information as we continue um, to, to, to move into a place where the interaction and the sort of intimate nature of space being involved or affected by almost anything that might happen in conflict, right? At some point, um, what kind of information does the commander need to have access to in order to be able to properly um, undertake some of these assessments? So we, we see some of these discussions with respect to urban warfare. Um, you know, what kind of expertise and advice needs to be provided about the nature of the civilian infrastructure? Um, do you need to have someone who understands how the power system works or the water system works or how XYZ action might have these follow on effects? Um, that's also highly relevant in the, with respect to space. Um, do we need to have the capability to understand not only what our action will do with respect to the adversary's capabilities and the civilians in our conception of what the conflict zone is, not a formal term, conflict zone, obviously, but do we need to now understand like the network of satellites and what they do and um, be able to understand that if you take out, um, you know, Starlink, um, you're thinking about your conflict here, but there's going to be, you know, hundreds of millions of civilians in a totally different place that your brain's not thinking about that are now unable to um, not, and I'm not worried about them being able to get on Netflix, right? <laughs> That's not in the civilian harm concept of proportionality, but what if it takes out airline navigation? That's pretty significant for civilian harm. Um, again, emergency services, things like that. So that's another another piece is not just what you need to know, but but how do you end up knowing it, right? Who 
what sort of expertise needs now to be incorporated into the military staff? Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left on this panel and I want to make sure we get to some of our audience questions. Um, the first one I'm going to take because it kind of directly um, goes along with what you were just mentioning, uh, Professor Blank, and that's specifically about GPS satellites. And, and I think they offer a good use case. Obviously, you know, the, the first Iraq war was often considered the first space war because of how much space assets were utilized and perhaps no weapon was more associated with that than GPS guided munitions. So obviously GPS in the military, it was developed by the military, has a very close association, but yet it's become as much as any other space asset, something that's been uh, utilized by the civilian world. Um, and so I wonder if anybody just had thoughts on specifically GPS satellites, given how reliant both the civilian sector and the military sector are on this capability. Well, I think that Kieran may be perhaps uh, better suited to answer this question, uh, but I, as I understand it, the, with the number of uh, GPS satellites that are currently available, even if you destroy one uh, satellite, it doesn't really affect the function uh, or operation of GPS uh, at all. I think there's maybe some degradation uh, in terms of accuracy, uh, but certainly the GPS system itself um, uh, won't be that affected. I think that's how I, well, I'm not an expert in uh, space technology. So Kieran may be able to inform you of that more, perhaps more accurately. Yeah, thanks, Satoshi. So, I mean, there's a number of points there. One is that you have to have some serious capability to take out GPS in terms of, you know, the number of satellites that are used. Um, probably more realistically, you would degrade its, um, degrade its functionality. Um, I think the most realistic scenario where denial of GPS would, would occur would be you stop the downlink of GPS service, uh, maybe over a large civilian, you know, met metropolitan area that you're not necessarily in control of yet but you're looking to sort of take and you think that would give you you know quite a big advantage and the question there is well clearly you know um e even if you're assuming that that so do you get into complicated questions about is that attack or not and therefore triggering targeting but if you think um that, that an attack um is kind of effect focused um, and you reasonably expect there to be sort of, you know, death resulting from it, then it, you know, would be attacking the rest of the targeting all would kick in. Um, the problem there is, you know, and I, I've read into this, it's difficult to predict what the result would be. So, you know, you have um, economic effects, you have ambulance services relying uh, in, in lots of states on GPS services, you know, to better position um, where, where they need to grab someone and take them to hospital and you know, what effect would that have? But then we're getting back into that point that we, we talked about earlier, you know, how do you quantify the risks there and, you know, um, how do you map all that out and, and anticipate what the harm would be? But, but I think, um, you, yeah, and also that often it's assumed that you take out GPS, well, what, well that's, you know, that's it. A lot of devices can switch to a different service, whether that's Galileo, whether that's GLONASS, et cetera. So it's a lot more complicated than just, okay, GPS is down, that's it. I okay. think, um, oh, go ahead. well, just one, um, I wanna add in one piece here, but as a starting point, I think um, there's been an automatic assumption that, that we're past the military objective question, right? We're discussing this in the context with the GPS satellite of proportionality. So I just wanna point that out that, you know, it seems that, and I don't dispute that, a GPS satellite that the adversary is using to, in some way for its military operations, yes, is a military objective, but we have to understand the civilian uses. But, you know, I want to I wanna throw out one other thing. Um, we haven't talked at all about passive precautions here um, and what obligations um, a state needs to take to protect its own population in the course and what that might mean. And um, I raise that here with respect to this conversation about GPS satellites, because um, uh, I, I've heard some, you know, interesting by one of my colleagues, an interesting idea that there should be some satellites that should be 
um, protected in the manner that we think about uh, protecting objects that produce hazardous forces, things like that. Um, in essence, when it enables the adversary to abide by its distinction and proportionality and precautions obligations, if you take that out, you're essentially making it impossible for the adversary, well, not impossible, a lot harder for the adversary to uphold its obligations. So there's some, you know, I, I thought that was an interesting point. You have to spool that one out a lot more. Um, but I just wanted to throw the idea of passive precautions into the conversation because we hadn't raised that yet. And it's highly relevant in terms of thinking about protection of civilians and what do states need to do to protect their own space assets as a way of, um, if not necessarily fulfilling the black letter law of Article 58B of additional protocol one for those who, if Article 58, for those who are parties to it, but even any customary law notions, um, you know, we can't, I, I think it's a, it's not reasonable to say you just, you know, don't worry about them. If the adversary takes them out, well, that's just too bad for your civilian population. That can't quite be the answer, but it's hard to know what it would mean to take those precautions. Yeah, and, and also with passive precautions, the question, you know, when does that obligation kick in? Because if you've structured your, you know, your space infrastructure prior to a conflict, so that it, you know, complicate, you know, maybe deliberately to complicate the targeting picture, whether that's to disaggregate the number of satellites you've got, so you know, rather than having exquisite capability in a small number, you you put up, uh, you know, hundred satellites that, that do the same job, or you know, you've deliberately put. Um, you put, you, know, you put your your hosted payload on on another state satellites or whatever else you know um, is at what point are you thinking about Article 58 and also realistically um, the way Article 58 has been dealt with in the past it's it seems to be a fairly weak obligation um, that doesn't mean to say it should be but state practice doesn't give it a lot of teeth. Okay, we have a question from Chris O'Meara. He says, for targeting, I argue that the continuation of use ad bellum necessity, <coughs> excuse me, to arm conflict can potentially help with the civil, the civilian military conundrum in outer space. Use ad bellum necessity requires defensive force to have a defensive purpose. This can be understood in my opinion that the use of defensive force must have some connection with the ongoing or anticipating armed attack for it to be necessary. This adds a use ad bellum requirement that overlays and applies in addition to the IHL targeting requirements. Thoughts there? Um, I may be understanding the question or the theory incorrectly, um, but if the idea is that every, every action taken in the course of an armed conflict you have to stop and think, is this necessary in self-defense? Um, I don't think that's, that's not how I understand the law. Um, because when you operate in armed conflict, you don't only act defensively. So to suggest that all your uses of force have to be defensive, um, I think is operationally illogical. If instead um, you're, 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 thinking at a much higher altitude about, um, let's think about a particular, you know, about the campaign as a whole, is it in line with that initial core necessity of responding to repelling, deterring an armed attack? Um, and I just have that as a, a seasoning in essence um, on the campaign, right? So that, that, somehow, however we know when we've stepped beyond that necessity, we've got to now be concerned. Um, but I, I, I would caution against applying a rule of necessity to um, justify specific actions, attacks, and so on taken in the course of armed conflict. I mean, because you, you end up in situations where you say, well, you know, can I move my forces from point A to point B? Uh, because I might, um, you know, uh, create some harm, right? I have to think about constant care, et cetera. 
But do I also have to think about whether it's necessary um, in, or in, 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 in this immediate movement in self-defense? Um, that's a level of granularity that I don't think the use at vellum um, addresses. And I don't think, I, I think it, it, it has a corrosive influence on the use in Bello um, and maybe is conflating military necessity with use ad bellum necessity, which are not the same thing. But like I said, I, I might've misunderstood the, the theory um, of the question, but those are my. Okay, kind of a related question we have um, relates back to the use ad bellum argument as well and, and question whether it's a bit circular. The question is, uh, when we ask about future state practice in order to determine what we mean by a use of force or armed attack, are we really just talking about reverse engineering what constitutes use of force or armed attack from what generates a self-defense response? It seems we are heading into a tautological law. Armed attacks justify self-defense and we define armed attacks by what produces self-defense responses. Um, Perhaps Kieran or somebody else have any thoughts on that question? Uh, well, that's a, if that was uh, springing from what was discussed earlier, that I obviously was very uh, inarticulate and didn't express myself very well. So um, I, I don't think, I, I'm not entirely sure what this is getting at, but if it's about the, the norms informing what's in an armed attack and that sort of being future looking, um, you know, that, that was more about assessing what the environment's going to look like, and that's going to feed into your factual analysis, which you obviously have to do when you're applying the law in any context. Um, I don't see there being a tautology there. Okay, there's a I question. Um, this, oh, sorry, ahead, sorry, if I, sorry, I think this was um, responding to my inarticulateness um, originally um, when I was talking about state practice and um, so let me say that state practice in this respect includes states who comment, condemn, affirm, et cetera, the actions of either the state that acted, thinks it's the victim, et cetera. So we're not only talking about state practice with respect to the two um, in the arena, but um, looking at what do other states say before the UN? How does the UN Security Council respond? Um, what do states say in their general comments on that? And that's um, a very productive way to understand um, sort of the evolution of custom in this area. So um, yeah, so I apologize if, if my earlier comments about developing the lack of state practice and how it might develop um, was confusing in that regard. No, thank you for the clarification. Um, let's see, there's a question that has to relate to cultural heritage sites, very interesting. It says, given section nine of the Artemis Accords that speaks to the protection and preservation of cultural, cultural heritage sites and objects beyond earth, to what extent would you say that the tenets of the 1954 Hague Convention and its protocols for the protection of sites and objects of cultural heritage during an armed conflict could have some extraterrestrial applicability in the militariz militarization of outer space? Um, so, I mean, in theory, that there's a potential. Uh, you're gonna, it's going to be difficult to get the uh, the agreed symbol up there for a start. Um, but <laughs> but there is the possibility. I think if you, you know, um, when we talk about conflict in space, I think realistically we're mainly talking about the void between celestial bodies. However, with obviously recent announcements, there have been suggestions of various states that are going to put up some kind of. Um, permanent or semi-permanent, you know, kind of um, habitation up there for, for whatever reason. Um, so so that's, a, that's a potential thing in the future. Um, I don't think it's, it's completely off the table, um, but clearly that wasn't what the Hague uh, Convention was, was driving at. And then you get back into the discussion Hitoshi was dealing with earlier about, you know, which treaties apply um, all their customer equivalents based on, you know, um, normal rules of interpretation. <laughs> 
Okay, um, thank you very much. I apologize if we didn't get to everybody's uh, questions in the comments, but I wanna make sure that um, I'm not uh, going over time. Um, hopefully, uh, uh, Professor Cherry will invite me back someday, and if I violate the time procedures, I'm pretty sure I won't. So at this point, I'm going to thank our panelists, uh, Squadron Leader Tinkler, Professor Nasu, and Professor Blank for a, a fascinating discussion. I very much enjoyed it, um, and uh, I hope to have similar conversations in the future. Thank you very much, and back over to you, Colonel Cherry. Thanks so much, Jeff, and I can assure you that you are one of Stockton Center's favorite sons, and we will always invite you back. Uh, so I echo uh, Jeff's comments. Thank you to our panelists. Um, and we're going to go on a 10 minute break. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to remind you um, to use the Q&A. Um, there's a ton of questions we didn't get to. So um, you can certainly pose them in a different way in the second session if they apply. Um, and make sure you also give a thumbs up to questions that you find particularly interesting or thought provoking. That will help our, uh, our moderator. Uh, Professor Henschel von Heining in the next session, uh, select which questions to choose. Um, I will also repost the Stockton Center website, which has a place where you can sign up for our email alerts. I also post the event page because this entire event today is being recorded and will be posted sometime next week on the Naval War College YouTube page. And on the event page for this event today, uh, the video will be posted where you can just directly link to the YouTube page. And that'll be sometime next week. Uh, so take a minute to refresh your coffee, your tea, check to see if the ever given the tanker that's in the Suez Canal has been freed. I, I, I assume not, um, but you never know. It could happen today. So thank you very much. We will see you at 1040 Eastern time in 10 minutes. <laughs>
Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, my name is Alphonse van Heusden and I serve as uh, the Assistant Secretary General of the International Society for Military Law and the Law of War. On behalf of the Society, I would like to extend our gratitude to the Stockton Centre for this uh, wonderful opportunity to work together. And special thanks also to the Society's US group, chaired by Lieutenant Colonel John Cherry, uh, for their invaluable support. Before we start today's second panel, I seize the opportunity to say a quick word about the International Society for Military Law and Law of War for those of you who are not familiar with the organization. Uh, this society was founded in 1956 as an international non-political and non-profit making association of practitioners and academics interested or active in the field of the law of armed conflict, military law, and related domains. Uh, we study and we disseminate these branches of the law by organizing conferences, seminars, and other events such as today's online panels. Furthermore, we publish a multilingual peer-reviewed journal known as the uh, Military Law and the Law of War Review, but also a series called the Recueil and other publications so, such as the Leuven Manual on the International Law Applicable to Peace Operations. Uh, there is much more to discover, such as the Society's 22 national groups, its boards, specialized committees, documentation center, etc. But in the interest of time, I simply refer to the Society's website for that. Uh, the members are the most important resource of the Society. Uh, if you wish to apply for membership of the society, you can do so by applying for membership of the national group of your country, if there is one, or you can also choose to fill out the membership application form available on the society's website in order to join the society without joining a national group. Now, it is my privilege to introduce the moderator of today's second panel, Professor Wolf Heinzel von Heineck from the Europa Universität Viadrina in Frankfurt order. Uh, for his impressive bio, I again refer to the society's website as he's currently also the president of our society. Uh, nevertheless, in this particular context, I wish to repeat uh, that in the academic years 2003-2004 and 2012-2013, he was the Charles H. Stockton Professor of International Law at the U.S. Naval War uh, College. Um, the panel will discuss space law limits to military presence and activities in outer space. Uh, Mr. President, dear Wolf, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, good morning or good afternoon to the panelists uh, who have all shown a high degree of flexibility because we had to shift the two panels. Thank you for this. Uh, this panel will be organized in a slightly different manner than the first. It will be done the old European way. In other words, uh, the panelists will give their presentations one after the other, and then we will have, I hope, sufficient time for questions from the audience. So we will start the panel with Mrs. Elina Morozova, who is the executive director of Intersputnik, International Organization of Space Communications. As you may know, an intergovernmental satellite telecommunication audience with the headquarters in Moscow, Russia. Uh, there she is responsible for relations with the organization's member countries and the United Nations system, including, of course, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Mrs. Morozova will address legally binding limitations on military activities in outer space, in particular the well-known treaties, including the Outer Space Treaty, and the obligations of states with regard to their military activities in outer space. And she may also have the time to address some of Russia's initiatives in the field. The second panelist is Mrs. Sheinez Boafia, who is the executive secretary of the European Center for Space Law within the European Space Agency. Before joining that 
um, Center. She worked at the Institute of Space Law and Telecommunications as a research and project coordinator. Mrs. Boif Boifia will address the question of non-legally binding mechanisms and instruments in the context of military activities in outer space by giving an overview of the various non-binding proposals and initiatives that are to provide a pragmatic sol solution to the gaps that may exist in legally binding instruments. And finally, and certainly last but not least, there will be Major Matthew Zellner, who is the Chief of Space Operations and International Law at the Combined Force Space Component Command in Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. In this role, he advises a dual-headed command with 16,000 personnel and 200 units at 58 worldwide locations providing space effects to terrestrial operations. Major Zellner will focus on the legal implications of labels such as warfighting domain and the gray areas of the law we see on the operational level. And without further ado, Mrs. Morozova, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, dear colleagues and friends, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, whichever place and time zone you are in now. Uh, first of all, I would like to warmly thank the co-organizers of this online conference for launching such a timely and topical uh, discussion. It is an honor for me to take part uh, in it. And uh, within the, the framework of this panel, I would like to describe some limits which are imposed by international space law on military presence and um, activities in outer space. And let me start with uh, reminding you that uh, uh, space law is generally associated with five United Nations treaties. Uh, the Outer Space Treaty of uh, 1967, uh, which is the first and the most comprehensive treaty and uh, has more than 100 uh, states parties, uh, this treaty provides a general framework for the regulation of uh, space activities. Uh, it is um, the foundation for the other four UN space treaties which were adopted uh, consequently. They are the Rescue and Return Agreement, the Liability Convention, the Registration Convention, and the Moon Agreement. And these five UN space treaties, along with uh, international law in general, uh, govern all aspects of space activities, uh, what is important irrespective of their nature. While, of course, military space activities have always been in the focus of the interests of all states. Uh, from the very beginning of space era, uh, when the first artificial satellite was launched, states realized that outer space had just acquired a new practical value. It was indeed the ultimate height which uh, ever was reached by humans, and uh, this height uh, could clearly offer significant strategic benefits to the first covers. Uh, more so at that time, both the Soviet Union and the United States successfully demonstrated their nuclear capabilities, and that also influenced the formation of space law. Uh, that is why the UN General Assembly immediately adopted a resolution which urged states to ensure that sending objects through space must be exclusively for peaceful purposes. And later, this concept of the peaceful uses of space was reflected in a great number of resolutions, other UN documents, and even state practice, and is now considered fundamental in space law. But the question is, and uh, Professor Nasu has mentioned this question during the previous panel, what uh, this concept practically means. It is generally accepted that peaceful does not mean non-military. More so, of course, uh, uh, the military use of space was uh, of the top priority of those uh, spacefaring nations which started to explore outer space. It is generally accepted that peaceful means non-aggressive. 
and uh, such interpretation uh, shares the fundamental principle of the UN Charter, which bans the threat or use of force, but allows force for self-defense and uh, if it is sanctioned by the Security Council. So we can assume that uh, any military space operation is lawful as long as it does not constitute a prohibited threat or use of force and does not otherwise violate international law, including space law. Uh, regarding space law, uh, legally binding rules which impose specific limitations on military space activities are provided in uh, two out of five uh, UN space treaties. They are the Ultra Space Treaty and uh, the Moon Agreement. The Ultra Space Treaty establishes a legal regime for both outer space and celestial bodies, which are treated somehow differently, while the Moon Agreement only covers uh, celestial bodies. And the title of this agreement should not be confusing. It does really address all celestial bodies within the solar system, but not only the Moon. As regards outer space, uh, from the perspective of the Outer Space Treaty, there is a ban on nuclear weapons or any other weapons of mass destruction. States are prohibited uh, from placing in orbit around the Earth any objects which carry nuclear weapons or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction. They are also prohibited from installing such weapons on celestial bodies or stationing such weapons in outer space in any other manner. So the list is uh, not uh, complete. This ban, however, does not address um, what is called ballistic trajectories uh, of objects uh, which can carry weapons of mass destruction. And this means that the mere transit of um, um, object through space, which uh, has a nuclear warhead, uh, which can be launched from point to point on the Earth, is not prohibited by the Outer Space Treaty itself, but is of course governed by other applicable rules of international law. Uh, it also worth saying that the UN Space Treaties do not define uh, weapons of mass destruction. On the one hand, it is um, well established that chemical and biological weapons are considered also weapons of mass destruction. However, we have to uh, keep in mind that there is no permanent human life in near space so far, and uh, hence the consequences of the use of such types of weapons might be very much different from those which um, can be on the Earth. On the other hand, uh, once again, due to the uh, specificity of uh, space and the laws of physics, the use of some other types of weapons in space uh, may have much more destructive consequences than on the Earth, uh, where they are not considered uh, as weapons of mass destruction. And finally, the Outer Space Treaty itself does not prohibit the placement of uh, conventional weapons in space. But for some uh, states, limitations uh, do exist. For instance, a long time ago, uh, Russia undertook a unilateral obligation not to be the first to place uh, any weapons in outer space. And since then has been encouraging other nations uh, to follow this example. And as of today, some 30 states have uh, such a political commitment and for them, uh, placement of conventional weapons in space is also uh, not permissible, at least until any other state does it. Uh, the legal regime of celestial bodies in terms of their military use, according to the Outer Space Treaty, is stricter than uh, that of outer space. According to the wording of the Outer Space Treaty, the Moon and other celestial bodies must be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. And we are still arguing about what peaceful purposes means. And uh, of course, adding the word exclusively in this discussion does not make uh, things easier. Um, once again, two main approaches exist uh, on how to interpret this uh, uh, notion of exclusively for peaceful purposes. The first one provides that celestial bodies are fully, totally demilitarized and any activity of military nature is prohibited on celestial bodies 
The other viewpoint adopts uh, a narrower interpretation stating that only those military activities are prohibited on celestial bodies, which are clearly listed in the Outer Space Treaty. And according to this treaty, besides the ban of uh, nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, um, testing of any kinds of weapons is not allowed on celestial bodies. Uh, also, the establishment of military bases, installations and fortifications and um, uh, the conduct of any type of military maneuvers are prohibited. And uh, as far as I am concerned, a stricter approach than that one saying that no military activity at all is possible on celestial bodies is widely spread. And uh, this poses questions on how the moon will be exploited soon, especially taking into account some mining projects and the desire that this activity is somehow protected. Uh, the legal framework of uh, military space activities on celestial bodies was further developed in the moon agreement. It introduces additional limitations, which are obligatory only for 18 states. So we can compare the outer space, uh, outer, uh, space treaty has uh, more than 100 states, while the moon agreement has 18 states. And the moon agreement prohibits uh, weapons of mass destruction not only on, but also in celestial bodies. Another limitation relates to orbits around or trajectory to or around celestial bodies. They also must uh, be free from uh, weapons of mass destruction and prohibiting uh, using uh, trajectories uh, by prohibiting using trajectories. This uh, agreement seems to forbid any type of uh, gravity assistance from being used to redirect uh, such weapons. Uh, consequently, objects carrying weapons of mass destruction must not transit along celestial bodies orbits. And of course, it is only applicable um, to those states which are parties to the Moon Agreement. The Moon Agreement also reiterates the prohibition of the threat of use of force, as uh, it is specified in the UN Charter, and also prohibits any other hostile act or threat of hostile act. Uh, neither the Moon Agreement nor Travaux Preparatoire provide details on uh, what content was given by the drafters of the Moon Agreement to this notion of a hostile act. And uh, we can now only assume that there might be an act which is hostile in its nature, but is less grave than the use of force and force being prohibited by the Moon Agreement. Another set of rules which comes close to the regulation of military operation in space is a, a mechanism, a twofold mechanism of prior consultations. On the one hand, such consultations must be undertaken. On the other hand, they may be requested. And this mechanism is triggered when a state has reason to believe that a planned space activity may cause what is called potentially harmful interference uh, to activities of other states. And uh, though there is no definition of harmful interference in space law, military operations may uh, clearly have an element of interference with space activities of other actors. For example, space debris can be regarded as causing uh, such interference. Uh, hence, if a state plans a military space operation that creates space debris on orbits which are used by other uh, space actors, um, such a state is uh, expected to undertake uh, these uh, prior consultations. Uh, but it is important to stress that space activities to which interference can be caused uh, must be peaceful. If not, uh, then this um, mechanism of prior consultations is not applicable. And finally, the Outer Space Treaty not, neither obliges states to enter into proposed consultations, nor requires that uh, states which are involved in such consultations reach any kind of resolution of the issue. And uh, no prior consent is necessary for any state to proceed with its uh, space activity. Um, what is also unique in space uh, law, and it was uh, to some extent mentioned during the previous panel, is the regime of international responsibility for national activities in outer space. 
if we compare uh, this regime with the customary law of uh, state responsibility, uh, the, threshold, the threshold for the attribution of a conduct uh, to uh, the relevant state or to the appropriate state uh, using the language of the Outer Space Treaty is much lower. States are responsible not only for space activities of their governmental agencies, but they are also responsible for the activities of non-governmental entities, which uh, term can include private companies and individuals. Uh, this uh, responsibility certainly applies to any type of space activity that is licensed by a state. And it is also argued, and I would say a well uh, spread um, understanding of space law that all space activities which are conducted on the territory of a state and all space activity uh, activities which are conducted by these states nationals on any territory are national space activities of that state uh, which it is responsible for and it is very important to understand that uh, this type of international responsibility can result in uh, uh, legal consequences. Uh, more so, it is a general rule that a launching state is internationally liable for damage caused by its uh, space object on the Earth, in uh, airspace uh, and in outer space. And this rule is relevant to military space operations in peacetime. So it was also mentioned during the uh, first panel that uh, this rule will be applicable when we are speaking about peacetime operations. And uh, it is important here that liability can only be invoked if damage is um, caused by a space object, for example, um, as a result of a physical collision, and if damage is caused not by a space object, for instance, by the use of radio frequency spectrum, I mean, jamming or whatever, it will not be covered by the rules of liability. Um, it does not, however, preclude the application of the rules of international responsibility of states. Uh, another set of rules which is relevant to space objects is uh, the registration regime uh, of space law. The registration convention requires that the launching state registers its space object and um, more so submits information to the UN Secretary General. Uh, this submission of information uh, by states which are not bound by the registration convention can be done and actually is done on a voluntary basis in accordance with the UN uh, General Assembly resolution. Uh, what is important here, the registration regime covers all space objects, including dual use and military ones. And today states um, do register uh, their military satellites. However, states have um, um, an extent of discretion how their general function is described, I mean the function of uh, their military space object. For instance, some states uh, register satellites which are known to serve nation's uh, security and defense purposes and describe them as telecommunication satellite. Uh, without uh, having a reference to their use for military space activities. And we can compare such a kind of a description with uh, some other satellites which serve exclusively commercial purposes and they are also registered as uh, telecommunication satellites. So it is important to understand that states can freely uh, describe their satellites as clearly military or um, just omitting this information. But uh, what is important here, uh, the UN register is a primary source of information and it is public. So whatever states submit to the UN register, it is open uh, to anybody which is looking for information about whether this or that satellite can serve military or uh, other purposes. Uh, rescue and return obligations have also been referred during the first panel um, and the astronauts are um, um, considered the envoys of humankind. Clearly during the peacetime, uh, this type of obligations which are imposed um, on states and on astronauts to run the assistance to each other uh, equally applies to astronauts which 
are uh, military or non-military. We all know that even those who are um, uh, involved in scientific operations on the International Space Station uh, stations are members of the military. And um, I also would like to agree with the first panel that it would seem reasonable to assume that the outbreak of an armed conflict could constitute a fundamental change of circumstances, uh, which uh, could also change the astronaut status from that one of an envoy of humankind to that of a, a combatant. Um, and the rescue and return obligation with regard of space object were also touched upon. And during the uh, conflict, the situation seems uh, easier than with astronauts. Uh, the rescue agreement is considered to be suspended between uh, the states which are parties to a conflict and the adversary space objects uh, can be captured and destroyed, provided that, of course, other applicable rules of international law are complied with. Uh, when conducted military space operations, states should also take into consideration other fundamental principles of international space law, uh, which can be found in the Outer Space uh, Treaty. But of course, uh, as it was mentioned, the main problem is uh, uh, to understand how to apply these principles correctly. And uh, in this regard, let me just refer uh, to some recent developments um, at least two international projects are currently being implemented, which are aimed to objectively articulate and clarify international law applicable to military activities in outer space. The first one is called MILAMOS, where uh, a group of international experts is drafting the manual on international law applicable to military uses of outer space. The other project is called VUMERA, uh, where an international group of experts is working on the manual on the international law of military space operations. And uh, we are lucky today to have experts from these two projects in our virtual room. I'm sure it's needless to explain the importance of such manuals for the promotion of the rule of law and for ensuring its common understanding. Uh, we have to admit that conflicts in space are not inevitable and international cooperation can help avoid tough scenarios and protect the unique space domain so it remains available for the benefit of the current and future generations of all states and I'm sure it's our uh, common desire. Uh, this brings me to the end of my uh, contribution and I look forward to further discussion. Well, thank you, Mrs. Morozova, for this brilliant overview over the existing heart law and uh, of the initiatives uh, of the Wumera and the Milamos manual. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to Mrs. Wafia. Thank you very much. Um, just to make sure that uh, you can actually hear me. I didn't get to make a, a sound test. Thank you very much. Um, naturally, uh, I would like to extend you know, my appreciation uh, to the organizers uh, of the webinar. Uh, I really think that uh, this webinar actually constitute a very important resource um, you know, to discuss topical issues, uh, especially with the current context. Um, and I also hope that everyone is, is, is safe and, and healthy um, uh, wherever uh, you may be. Uh, my name is um, Shainez Poifia, um, and uh, I would just like to make a, a short clarification um, that I am no longer the ECSL Executive Secretary, but now uh, being affiliated uh, to the International Institute um, of um, Space and Telecommunications uh, that is actually uh, based in Paris. Um, so the idea for me here today um, is really to develop further what has been said um, and also very well introduced uh, by my co-panelist Elina. Um, so so we, we saw that there is indeed you know, a, a legal framework um, establishing um, limits and constraints, um, and that is present in, in international space law uh, as a way to limit military activities in our space. Uh, but the question really is whether this framework is actually sufficient uh, to regulate this kind of activities. Um, and I think that we can already get that question out of the way, um, as the answer is unfortunately uh, no. Um, and this is an observation. 
um, that I'm not uh, making up, but that was actually, uh, that can be found actually in several UN resolutions um, that actually further specify that the legal uh, regime applicable to outer space uh, by itself um, does not guarantee um, the prevention of, uh, of uh, arms race in our space. Um, and that there is, um, and here I quote, um, an actual need to consolidate um, and reinforce uh, the regime, uh, but also to enhance um, its effectiveness. Um, I believe that um, later in 2014, uh, the UN General Assembly uh, also reiterated that uh, the current legal regime is no guarantee uh, that an arms race will be prevented in our space and that there is you know, a need to examine further means to prevent um, such a grave danger uh, to the international uh, peace and security. Um, and so, of course, here, you know, the, the legal regime that uh, is being uh, referred to um, is really the one that was described uh, earlier by, by Elina. And um, the goal here, um, you know, will be for us to go through um, some, not all of them, uh, because there are people actually writing legal thesis about this. So if you want to go into the details, um, it might take quite some time, uh, but really to get, you know, the essence of um, um, existing um, soft law instruments um, that were brought up as a way to further draw the lines uh, of military activities in our space. Um, and I think we can um, directly jump in um, into um, a very recent uh, initiative uh, that was brought up between uh, 2012 and 2013 uh, with a group of actually 15 governmental experts called the GGE uh, that was nominated uh, and passed by uh, the UN um, Secretary General uh, pursuant to a UN general resolution. Uh, and if I remember, correctly, you can also actually read the resolution, it's um, resolution 65, uh, 68. Um, and um, under this resolution, uh, the group of government experts basically undertook um, a study on the transparency and confidence building measures um, in outer space activity. And um, a similar study was actually undertaken 20 years uh, earlier. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, was not a success. Um, and this group of government experts um, elaborated on the characteristics and uh, the criteria uh, for outer space, um, transparency and confidence building measures. Um, and what they agreed upon uh, was that those transparency and confidence building measures should be voluntary. Uh, and this is where the shift uh, operates between, you know, uh, legally binding instruments that we can find with the Outer Space Treaty um, and non-legally binding um, instruments that uh, you will see um, are becoming more and more uh, used, um, not only in the context of military activities, but also more generally uh, in the context of, of space activities. Um, I think we all heard about the, the the, the long-term sustainability guidelines that were recently endorsed. Um, you see um, it has nothing to do with military, it has to do with uh, a sustainable use of our space, but still uh, it was decided that the, the fashion and the format to do it would be um, a non-legally binding instrument. Um, but what the group of government experts um, also agreed upon was that although it should be um, on a voluntary basis, um, that this kind of instrument could not constitute um, a substitute uh, to actual uh, legally binding um, arrangements. Um, and so actually this report of the group of government experts um, was approved uh, by consensus um, through um, a typical UN uh, General Assembly resolution, which is um, UN Resolution 6815, um, you can also read it. Um, and I, I know we don't have much time, but I, I would definitely suggest um, to anyone here in the audience to really have a look at, at those resolutions, who really show actually the, the mindset uh, of member states at that time. 
um, and the outcome consensus report was submitted uh, to the 68th session, um, as I said, um, and then endorsed. Um, in particular, um, the report includes actual recommendations to enhance uh, transparency uh, of our space activities uh, through many different means, um, notably uh, the exchange of information between countries, uh, space policy and activities, uh, also risk reduction um, notifications, um, and um, something called visits by experts to national space facilities as a way to enhance uh, this so-called transparency um, set as a goal. Um, and also, um, this group of experts recommended um, establishing increasing coordination uh, between the Office for Disarmament Affairs um, and the Office for Outer Space Affairs, um, but also with any other uh, appropriate um, UN entities. Um, so this is um, a first example of non-legally binding um, instrument that was brought up um, following um, you know, the, the, the actual observation that the current um, legal framework, legally binding legal framework uh, was actually not sufficient. Um, another, um, and I think probably the most important one, um, instrument um, that was also brought up uh, you know, as a way to counter the shortcomings uh, that were um, established and seen uh, within the current legal framework existing, um, is the International Code of Conduct for Outer Space Activities. Um, I believe it to be the, the most advanced um, uh, non-legally binding piece. Um, and the objective behind uh, this International Code of Conduct um, was actually to enhance um, safety and security in outer space through the development um, and the implementation uh, of transparency and confidence building measures. Um, and in 28, um, actually, the European Union initiated this procedure um, to develop this, this code of conduct. Um, and the code, uh, the code was um, um, imagined as um, uh, to function as a non-legally binding treaty well, first as a, as a legally binding treaty, uh, but then um, obviously um, it was realized that uh, a non-legal binding instrument uh, will probably um, be easier to implement without any formal enforcement mechanisms, um, especially in a multilateral setting. Um, and the legal ground for this international code of conduct was actually the UN GA resolution 6175, which uh, called member states to submit proposals um, on um, uh, to submit proposals um, to to you know, following um, the, the 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 failure of the Paris uh, system, um, and so the legal framework under which um, this code of conduct was conducted um, is of course the e uh, EU uh, Commons Foreign and Security Policy. Um, and also council conclusions from um, 28, um, 2010, and also the council decision um, from uh, 2012. Um, this code of conduct is based on three main principles. Um, the first one is um, all countries inheritable right to use space um, for peaceful purposes. Um, the second being the protection of security and uh, reliability of space object in orbit. Um, and last but not least, um, consideration for states' um, legitimate defense interests. Uh, once agreed upon, uh, this, um, this code of conduct uh, was expected to be applicable uh, to um, all outer space activities conducted by states, uh, but also uh, corporations, um, universities, um, and the code uh, is also intended to address both safety uh, and sustainability of space environment, um, as well as the stability and the security in outer space. So it's not um, a code uh, that uh, is intended to regulate only military activities, but more generally uh, the sustainable use of outer space. Um, and since um, it is aimed um, at both safety and security in outer space, uh, the EU actually stated 
that are existing um, international fora, such as the Conference on Disarmament um, and the UN Committee um, on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPUS, um, are actually not the appropriate fora uh, where the, the code of conduct should be discussed. Um, and by discussing um, the code of conduct outside these two uh, international fora, um, it also includes UN member states, uh, which are not members um, of these bodies. The EU um, also stated um, that it believes that um, uh, the non-legally binding and overarching nature of the code of conduct also means that um, it does not contradict uh, any ongoing discussions um, or any you know, uh, legally binding uh, treaty per se, um, and that the main goal is just to find an agreement um, on a text uh, that would be suitable um, and, and uh, applicable to security benefits um, in a short term. Um, so just briefly to go over um, the actual state of this code of conduct, um, that is um, that this code of conduct actually received um, mixed reactions uh, in the international community. Um, and of course, several emerging powers um, expressed concerns about not being involved in the process. Um, and um, there was also some substantive issues uh, that were found uh, with the draft, um, notably um, questions about vague terminology, uh, the lack of definitions, um, and also the fact um, that uh, it was not um, clear to which degree um, the code of conduct should be legally binding over states. Um, and um, after you know, extensive uh, interagency review, uh, also um, from the side of the United States government, um, it was assessed that the draft international code um, could actually limit space operations um, and that the US uh, would not um, actually abide by it. However, a proposal was made, was made by the US um, to also propose um, a draft uh, code of conduct that would be based on the European initiative um, without uh, you know, uh, subscribing to the um, EU initiative per se. Um, so just, I, I don't want to go over my time, but um, I think here um, the message to take home um, is that um, when you go over the, the, yeah, the, the actual overview of uh, existing non-legally binding instrument, um, I really think that um, an interesting point um, would be to take a bit of height and, and really analyze you know, this in, in the context of, of a wider con aspects and considerations uh, pertaining to space law and notably uh, what I um, evoked uh, at the beginning of my statement um, regarding this you know, tendency, this trend uh, of um, having soft law instruments uh, to deal with the certain aspects of space activities. And this is really something that is symptomatic of the last decades um, and that is also very symptomatic of military activities in general, but not only. Um, as I said, this is something that uh, uh, you will also find in, in, in environmental considerations. Um, so I mentioned the long-term sustainability guidelines, but uh, you can also find the, the space, the pre-mitigation guidelines and so on. So, so th there is really this uh, inflation of, of soft law instruments um, that perhaps say something about the current state of, of, um, of hard law. Um, and, um, and, and so non-legally binding instruments may really constitute, uh, and I believe so, a pragmatic solution uh, to the prevention uh, of an arsenalization um, of space uh, by actually making possible to overcome um, some of the rigidities that are implied uh, by the adoption of a legally binding instrument. Um, and there are actually many benefits uh, to opting for non-legally binding instruments. Um, it's just that, um, and, and actually uh, some of the benefits of, of uh, using uh, soft law um, is, is just as simple as the flexibility, uh, the fact that it's a speedest 
um, and the quickest uh, process of negotiation and conclusion. This is this is quite obvious. Um, and some very interesting benefits, such as the establishment also of um, you know um, a climate of trust between states. Um, but I also think that it's interesting to point um, that these exact benefits um, may also appear to be insufficient and unsatisfactory um, in the long term uh, for the exact same reasons, actually. Um, so um, I would say that the strength of soft law uh, will only be uh, demonstrated through the implementation of uh, those soft law instruments um, at a national level. Um, and um, this implementation at a national level will certainly uh, you know, show uh, the adherence um, and the effectiveness of soft law instruments. So there are uh, pros and cons uh, to having soft law instruments in the context of military activities. Um, and I do look forward to, to discussing these uh, pros and cons uh, with co-panelists and also with the, with the audience later on. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Boafia. And now I give the floor to Major Selna, please. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, first, thank you to this group for having me and allowing me to share this panel with such uh, esteemed experts and also share in the institution that you all have set up with such professionals and scholars. So thank you for that. Uh, these discussions are very badly needed. Um, I think the world is probably behind in having these types of tough discussions and these are issues we truly do see every day. So thank you. Uh, I'd first like to disclaim um, that the views presented here are my personal views and do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense or its components. And I'd also like to say the, that NATO, the Legal Gazette issue 42 coming out, I believe on July 1st, goes into a lot of these issues, the legal aspects of space. Um, I have a co-article in there talking about management of, of space data and transparency. Um, so I, anybody that's interested can follow on from these. And I'm sure the panelists agree that if we want to have afterwards discussions um, per, in personal capacities, just let us know. Uh, but thanks to the two previous panelists um, who discussed kind of the state of existing and potential future legal regimes to govern activities, including the militaries in outer space. And my focus here will be more on the operational level. So taking what we have in terms of the law as they have laid it out and then applying it into day-to-day -day operations and activities and contingency planning, which is what we deal with. So first, I'd like to address there are some buzzwords that probably the audience has seen and heard in the media in interviews with senior leaders. And those are that space is a quote, war fighting domain. And then also that states are quote, militarizing space. So the question we get asked a lot is, is there any legal import to somebody using those phrases or saying those phrases, even potentially um, high up figures? Technically, no, uh, that, that's the answer. These are phrases used by people who may perceive space as such, but just by calling something a war fighting domain or say something's being militarized, that does not have any legal import in and of itself. State militaries were essentially the first actors in space uh, beginning in the 1950s, as Ms. Morozova discussed. Um, and it could be argued that space is no more militarized now than it was 75, 50, 25 years ago. I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but there's certainly arguments on both sides. Now there are just more spacefaring states, which yes, have capabilities, but there are also more commercial spacefaring companies. And while some provide functions to states and militaries, many are used by people every day without probably knowing it. So, Every time people use cell phones, a lot of times television, internet, uh, looking at weather reports, et cetera, they're using space capabilities in the civilian day-to-day -day life. And at this point, roughly a third of space launches, of all space launches now, are commercial payloads. And there are, you know, to this day, thousands of satellites in orbit around the Earth. So next, I'd like to talk about the operational gray areas that we deal with that due to the body of law and exactly what the previous panelists said, they leave those questions unanswered in the gray areas that then people have to deal with. So looking at Article 9 of the OST, which was discussed, but the term of art 
due regard is mandated for states, which it's good that it's mandated and there is a standard. However, that standard is undefined. So nowhere in the treaty or in subsequent uh, issuances in any sort of treaty has the term due regard been defined. Similarly, as was discussed, harmful interference appears to be cautioned against. However, it is similarly undefined. And the remedy as given in the Outer Space Treaty is that international consultations are mandated if a state believes it will cause harmful interference. And if another state desires, it can request such consultations if it believes another state might, ca might cause harmful interference. However, in practice, no consultations uh, directly from this provision have occurred. And then similarly, as discussed, like due regard, it is undefined. The reasons why it was undefined during those treaty negotiations, there's probably lots of reasons, but what we have today now, 60 plus years later, uh, 50 plus years later, is that we have two terms that are very strictly discussed in the Outer Space Treaty. But when you're talking about conducting operations, they are undefined in an international context. Similar to this, we have a lack of customary international law which impacts day-to-day -day operations. So some, like additional protocol one of the Geneva Conventions that I will discuss more below, those provisions would extrapolate to space. And, and Professor Blank talked about that, how you would essentially apply low act, apply all of those rules, you'd extrapolate them to space. But there is not any robust customary international law legal regime specifically for space. So states could certainly create this at any point, whether through practices or an additional convention or treaty that perhaps reflects customary international law for state parties or would be truly binding international law. However, that customary international law development has not necessarily occurred strictly to space. I think this is unsurprising due to the length of time that states have been spacefaring. So if you think about it and compare it to other domains, uh, states have been acting in space for, let's say, up to 75 years at this point versus the land and sea domains where peoples and states have operated and contested for thousands of years. And only after this several thousands of years did we get the UN Convention Law of the Sea in the mid 20th century or the Hague and Geneva Conventions in the 20th century, essentially. And so all of those thousands of years of operations finally coalesced in states coming to some agreement. In some cases, after gravely uh, harmful conflicts, that it brought everybody to the table, or at least most states to the table, to agree on how to conduct operations. And in space, we've only been up there 75 years. And so it is hard to imagine that everything will be answered. I'm never uh, saying that all terrestrial and sea-based uh, operations are governed, but if you look at UN Convention Law of the Sea, they have very strict protocols with distances and what can occur there. And then I'd like to now shift towards talking about situations at the operational level, left of or short of armed attack or a use of force. So where we are not in conflict and we use what we have available to legally govern military activities. So we have the Outer Space Treaty, but as I just said, fairly vague in terms of its prescriptions and its definitions. The conventions, as Ms. Morozova discussed, are more specific, like your liability convention, your registration convention, the International Telecommunications Union, but some arguably have limited um, applicability to military activities in outer space. And some of them deal with, um, let's say, financial prescriptions or financial liability um, where states will pay others for damage as once has occurred under the liability convention with, I believe, Russia and Canada. However, those don't necessarily cover all of the law of armed conflict and all of the aspects of actually conflict as going into space. However, we do know that international law would apply. So that means we still have as potentially um, legally valid responses the following. So the doctrine of self-defense would apply. Now states differ on their spectrum of when some sort of response would be authorized. 
So you have, let's say on one end of the spectrum, the UN charter discussing that armed attack might be a threshold for the use of force in self-defense. Then you have other nations that may believe a hostile act demonstrated hostile intent would actually justify a response in self-defense. As we all know, or as most of us know on, on uh, this panel and this forum, there have been reams of articles and academic papers written over the decades on the thresholds of armed attack and whether that's the most grave uses of force or whether a simple use of force would apply. It's increasingly confusing because the UN Charter bans use of force, threat of use of force. So that seems to leave a gap in international law and that applies to space as well on where, where that sliding scale lands. Additionally, you have the doctrine of countermeasures. So this is where a state would be able to utilize an unlawful act in response to an unlawful act. So let's say state A is committing some unlawful act in space that would authorize state B an ability to utilize a potentially unlawful act for the mere purpose of getting state A to stop its unlawful act. It has to be necessary and proportionate. It has to stop when the original unlawful act stops. But this is again, fed from the Nicaragua K ICJ case and the international law that has developed since in extrapolating that kind of terrestri terrestrial based body of law into space. Now, one of the problems with that, and this again, I'm not trying to sound cyclical, but that, that's why this is tough, is in defining what is unlawful would then be a threshold issue to determine whether or not a countermeasure could apply or the second type of, of response, which is a retorsion under international law, whereby state A commits an unlawful act in space and state B then um, commits a lawful act. However, it's detrimental in some way to state A, again, necessary proportionate, and then trying to get state A to cease its unlawful behavior. So some common examples used are an embargo, a severing of diplomatic relations and whatnot. However, both of these doctrines and self-defense for that matter, open up and, and expose the fact that there is a gap in defining what is unlawful exactly. Is behavior A, behavior B, behavior C, where do we draw the line between unlawful? Where do we draw the line between armed attack, use of force, threat of use of force? All those issues are very difficult and it leaves states not necessarily guessing, but there's no body of law that you can absolutely point to and say, this is unlawful or this is lawful. Sure there are, and sure there are arguments of that, but when you get into those gray areas, it, it can become very difficult. So that was talking about the left of conflict. Now we can talk about in conflict. And as discussed in the panel, law of armed conflict or international human humanitarian law would apply. And again, that's based off largely existing codified and or customary international law such as the Geneva Convention, the additional protocols. So if the space domain became part of an armed conflict, we would use it, states would use it in my opinion. And um, for purposes of this, what I'm going to go into, we're gonna assume that the treaties that I'm discussing would not be suspended or a state would not opt out um, pursuant to this conflict. So again, what we're left with is extrapolating existing law to outer space. So we look, at additional protocol one. So these are big areas of analysis. And one of them is how to define a military objective. So at this operational level, you're talking about in conflict and you have um, spacefaring states utilizing space assets in a true conflict. We would look at article 52.2 distinction. Now it's worth mentioning um, with additional protocol one that Russia China, most of Europe, Canada, Australia, um, and the US either ascribe to it as signatories or they've ratified it or they adopt at least the provisions I'm talking about here as customary international law. So with asking whether or not something on orbit's a military objective in a conflict, you take that existing body of international law and you apply it. And so you would ask the question in Article 52.2, and that is, and this is a mouthful and it's commonly talked to as maybe a dual use test, but it has different parts to it or a two part test. And that is whether an object's nature, location, purpose or use makes an effective contribution to military action and whose partial 
for total destruction, capture, or neutralization in the circumstances ruling at the time offers a definite military advantage. So you have to analyze that space object and you basically have to ask whether or not it could or does contribute to military action and be able to articulate why or how somehow neutralizing it or destroying it in those circumstances ruling at the time would offer you know, state A in this case, a military advantage. This is, you would have to apply this test to military, uh, potential military objectives, and you would certainly have to apply this test for uh, dual use entities or those that are civilian owned or operated, but also have military signals running on it or military uses of it and whatnot. Again, like I talked about before, because of the impact and the, the sheer volume of commercial space activities and assets on orbit and how they uh, contribute to military operations in many ways, there's a lot of this analysis that has to take place. And unlike, let's say, a terrestrial operation or a terrestrial environment object facility uh, that may be you know, dedicated at one point um, at the advent of a conflict and they flip a steel factory over and it is completely used by the you know, opponent's military uh, to build bombs, let's say. In space, a lot of times it's a lot more difficult um, should you go into conflict because a commercial satellite provider might have, I don't know, 30 users or uh, 30 users of signals on it. And maybe one or two of the signals is actually leased by a military. So then you have lots of issues with that. And that takes me to part two of two, don't worry, but part two of this AP1 discussion, and that is on collateral effects or collateral damage or proportionality. And that is found in AP1 in articles 51.5b and also 57.2a3. And what this says is that attacks in a conflict are prohibited that, quote, may be expected to cause incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, or a combination thereof, which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. So what that leaves us with is an ex-ante balancing test that decision makers, through whatever regimes they're in, according to their state practices, must balance the fact that what concrete and direct military advantage would I stand to gain by doing X, Y, or Z to a satellite or a space-based system versus the injury to civilians or damage to civilian objects. And that damage to civilian objects which it, or, or personnel, which is all of what this is concerned about because as an aside, any sort of collateral damage to other military objects or people in a conflict are not uh, considered in this proportionality regime or measurement. So be it that the focus is on civilian personnel, civilian objects, you ask whether or not whatever you're doing is going, the damage to those civilian personnel or objects, if that's going to be excessive compared to your direct and military advantage gain. So it's a true balancing test. Now, one of the problems is, as, as is a theme for a lot of this, the term excessive is not actually defined or agreed upon in international law. So that leaves a lot of um, interpretation for states. However, looking at, uh, and I'll conclude with looking at three different, essentially situations where this would come up, where you try to use those measurements. So first, let's say something that uh, you're wanting to put in effect on an adversary in a conflict that's temporary and reversible. So think jamming and things like that where you don't actually cause any sustainable harm to the asset. You just temporarily interrupt the ability for the signals to be used. So you ask, and there's lots of debate in international law of how foreseeable you have to try to figure out those civilian impacts are going to be. So the Talon Manual, which deals with cyber, proposes you know, expected indirect effects, or Michael Schmidt, the scholar, has talked about reasonably foreseeable effects. Um, I like to cite uh, squadron leader Tinkler, who said before, um, the problem with those reasonably foreseeable effects is it's like a lottery ticket. 
And that means that if I buy a lottery ticket, um, it's reasonably foreseeable that I could win the lottery. However, in practice, it's one in several millions. So to anticipate that and try to measure that is a little difficult in terms of operations. So I've, I've adopted the term maybe directly foreseeable would be a better aspect to balance that. And there, it helps you understand that due to the signal environment and exactly what the previous panel talked about, is so difficult to fully ascertain to know on, let's say, a commercial satellite, if you have 30 signals running on it, if maybe only one's military, what are going to be your aspects to the others? And then the last two, quickly, to leave time for questions, um, if you have non-temporary, non-reversible effects to satellites, um, that's difficult because we can maybe borrow cybers talk the discussion on an attack threshold and whether or not, let's say, having to replace component parts or reboot systems, maybe we use that as standards for, for a proportionality analysis on making that balancing test like I previously discussed. And then finally, uh, destructive debris causing events. While the liability convention would certainly apply, again, talking about the armed conflict part of it, it is hard to imagine that a military gain in a conflict would actually justify endangering an entire space domain for 5, 10, 50 plus years, whereby space debris, even flecks of paint, which cause seven millimeter chips in ISS windows, where all that space free, the thousands of pieces would stay up there for decades, centuries, depending on what orbital regime and impact, it would be hard to imagine that that balance would outweigh. So leaving time for questions, I'll conclude there. And thank you again for giving me the floor, sir. Oh, thank you so much, Major Zana. And uh, yes, we have, uh, well, nearly 15 minutes for Q&A. And there have been some questions. And I will um, just summarize them. And then I would ask our panelists to provide their answers consecutively. So the first question is with regard to the vulnerabilities that obviously exist also in outer space, not only in the terrestrial environment. And will states not exploit those vulnerabilities irrespective of all the legal, legally binding and legally non-binding instruments we have heard about? Uh, in that context, there is the question of whether and to what extent such non binding codes of conduct and rules uh, are actually being observed by responsible states rather than by others. So isn't it uh, rather a matter that only those who may profit from such non-binding instruments will, at least for a limited time, uh, abide by them, but in the long run, they won't. The next question uh, is about uh, also related to the non-binding instruments, uh, we are witnessing a kind of fragmentation when it comes to military uses of outer space. Uh, so there are the original space lawyers, let me put it that way, and then there are the others. And this is also being uh, shown by the fact that we have two new manuals, or we will have two new manuals, the Umera manual on military activities in outer space and the Milamos, and obviously, the authors of the respective manuals take different positions, at least with regard to some of the uh, uh, aspects. And finally, with regard, I don't want to repeat the entire discussion on the applicability of the law of armed conflict. But um, the question is, of course, uh, let's assume it, it applies. But what about Major Zellner? A contribution to the enemy's war sustaining effort, which has been endorsed in the DOD Law of War Manual and in other publications of the United States. And finally, you are referring to countermeasures. I think this is a, a well taken point. But would you agree that countermeasures may involve a use of force remaining below the threshold of an armed attack? So I suggest that we will start with Mrs. Morozova again. Thank you for these questions and uh, the opportunity to give additional comments. First, regarding uh, binding versus non-binding. 
uh, of course, when we um, uh, speak about the ideal picture of the work, it would be the best ever situation that everything is written in stone. I mean that we have hard law, we have international treaties with global participation, but we must be uh, realists uh, and uh, for instance, we have on the table uh, the draft treaty on prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space and uh, of the threat or use of force ag against outer space objects. This is a joint proposal by Russia and China, which is left uh, in paper for more than 10 years. And we clearly see different approaches uh, of uh, states with regard to how uh, this uh, issue should be settled. Uh, to my understanding, uh, for instance, the Russian uh, Chinese project is uh, very much focused on trying to regulate the object, so to define weapons, uh, to prohibit weapons. And uh, this is uh, the major disagreement of the US and uh, other uh, states, which says that the definition lacks uh, uh, being clear and inclusive. And uh, some states prefer to speak about regulation behavior, not objects. So these two uh, positions are very much different. And if we can find a compromise by drafting a piece of soft law, it is in any case a, a step forward. And uh, there is a big political pressure um, placed in non-binding legal documents, for instance, UN uh, General Assembly resolutions. Of course, they are not legally binding, but I have never uh, seen a state which uh, uh, ever admitted that it does not comply with any non-legally binding regulation. We should keep this in mind that the pressure is very high and the soft law uh, instruments are also tend to be complied with. More so, we know that, of course, the process is very long uh, when nations adopt soft law instruments in their national legislation. We can see state practice and we can finally met um, uh, customary rules. Of course, it, it was absolutely um, a valid argument uh, saying that in space law, we cannot have uh, any customary rules so far because uh, we are in space only for 60 years. Uh, but um, if we turn to UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, they have a questionnaire uh, which they attend to different states and there exist uh, uh, responses by states which uh, can be boiled down into at least three norms which are regarded customary freedom of exploration and use, uh, non-appropriation appropriation principle, and uh, the application of international law to space activity and outer space. So uh, there is an opinion that customary rules um, really exist. So also non-binding instruments are important uh, in uh, several other respects. We also discussed the due regard and there is no standard but we can use some uh, non-legally binding instruments to uh, say that this is the practice, these are the standards or uh, emerging standards and uh, being in non-compliance with these non-legally binding documents may uh, to some extent evidence the lack of due regard on this or that part. So I think we should not uh, underestimate uh, soft law sources. With regard to the difference between uh, several manual, uh, probably the readers of the manual will be the best judges. Uh, I must say that even within one project, for instance, Milamos, experts do really have different views. And it is clear that different manuals can uh, see the issue from different angles. And this is actually uh, the benefit for, for the users of this manual. They can and see the mindset of uh, the expert um, uh, society and uh, maybe it can be useful for them to um, make proper decisions. So this is from my part. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mrs. Morodova. Of course, this begs the question whether the Russian Federation and or the People's Republic of China will really abstain from exploiting existing vulnerabilities also in outer space only because there are some non-binding uh, codes of conduct, etc. Mrs. Buafia, to you the question, of course, was 
uh, what is the value added of non-binding instruments and do they really contribute to the preparedness of states to be as transparent as you hope them to be? Well, thank you very much, first, Professor, for the for the question. Um, I think uh, my co-panelist um, Elina has already pretty much um, answered uh, part of the question um, in, in this respect that um, um, soft law should not be um, underestimated, uh, and that is uh, precisely because um, where uh, hard law uh, can sometimes show uh, some rigidities. Um, this is where soft law actually intervenes. And um, I would say that there is this tendency, um, a very funny tendency uh, to make the assessment that you know, the existing um, corpus uh, Eurospecialis is either outdated uh, or indeed uh, effective and self-sufficient and, and uh, everything is great. Uh, but this, like having this view is quite an extreme way of thinking, uh, which I believe uh, not to be suitable uh, for the reality of, of, of how uh, international public law works. Uh, there are different interests at stakes. Um, Elina also mentioned a very high political pressure, um, uh, and this is being translated um, in the way states can actually um, emit um, uh, legally binding or non-legally binding norms. Um, and I think that uh, indeed it would be amazing if uh, everything could be uh, set in stone uh, very clear from the beginning uh, and everyone would agree and shake hands. Uh, but unfortunately, it, it's not how um, uh, things work. And, and I think um, that things will come over time. Uh, through uh, notably uh, multilateral discussions. Um, and there are people currently working. We mentioned the Milamos uh, initiative, uh, but you know, recent history uh, also um, suggests that um, not only um, initiatives from states, um, like for example, the code of conduct, but also, um, and I think here, um, this is to open a bit the discussion uh, that uh, it's interesting to look also at other initiatives and not only this, binary uh, outlook, which is hard law or soft law, but also to look uh, at other efforts um, from non-governmental um, also efforts that have been um, successfully influencing uh, state behavior. Um, and I'm thinking here, for example, about the Tallinn manual. Um, and there are a lot of uh, instances and examples um, that show that uh, you know um, small initiatives here and there uh, can actually influence um, um, state behavior. Um, so I think we should look at the bigger uh, picture um, and really you know uh, override this uh, binary thinking of whether um, the current um, corpus juris specialist is indeed uh, outdated or is effective, is hard law the, the, the solution or is soft law. Uh, the actual solution. Um, it, it, it's really a matter of, of, of compromise here. Um, and, and, and really, um, things will come over time. Um, and um, this is, um, I think, the, the lesson that uh, should be uh, uh, taken from this uh, panel discussion. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Boafia. Uh, Major Zelna, you are the poor guy at the end of the panel who will have to answer all the remaining questions. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. And I'll, I'll be respectful of everybody's time. I know we're running out of it. Two minutes left. Also, my last name is Zellner. I was always called last when a substitute teacher called role. So I'm used to this. But um, so talking just the three issues, talking about vulnerabilities, about states exploiting. I mean, that's kind of an issue of international law. And I think of in civil liability judgments, I, I learned back in law school that it's always just at the end of the day, you just have a piece of paper. Um, so it depends on the actors actually subscribing to the system and the regime. Um, you know, the Russia-China uh, measure and, and proposal they had, you know, that I know some of the objections were that it didn't include verification of procedures and, and anti-satellite uh, weapons and whatnot. So if you don't have verification, again, then the issue is cyclical of not being able to verify whether or not people are exploiting the vulnerabilities, which is the whole issue uh, in and of itself. On the war sustaining measures question, um, you would still take those through AP1's objective and proportionality tests. Additionally, you'd have um, necessity, humanity, any other uh, of those LOAC provisions. So whether that's on orbit, terrestrial, 
you would take it through those tests that I discussed. And um, I hope that that answered the question. And I know we're running out of time. And then lastly, thank you so much for the question on countermeasures. That is exactly what I'm talking about. It's that gray area between lawful, peaceful behavior and then all the way to the other side, uses of force, armed attack under international law, uh, which would then authorize you know, forceful responses. So what countermeasures is dealing with are those sub uses of force, but when something's unlawful, so not prescribed by a treaty or in violation of some, some sort of uh, codified law or customary international law, but not reaching necessarily a use of force or an armed attack under international law. And so that is what I was talking about, left of conflict that would provide some sort of recourse for an aggrieved nation. And that's all I have, sir. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to all the panelists for their discipline and their flexibility. And now I can hand over to Colonel Cherry. Thank you very much. Ron Heineck, thank you very much. And, and thank you to each of the panelists in, in the second panel. Um, I agree, I appreciate your flexibility and understanding and also uh, a fantastic presentation by all certainly cutting edge um, issues, but uh, the four of you presented them in a very approachable way uh, by our, uh, for our audience. I also wanna again, thank Professor Von Heinig and Alphonse for their, uh, and their leadership in the International Society of Military Law and the Law of War, and for joining forces today with the Stockton Center and the Naval War College for today's event. You know, and of course, I can't miss another opportunity to remind everyone in the audience um, to go to the Stockton Center website to sign up for our, our mailing list for future events. Um, like I said, we have events May, June, um, in April, May, and June, um, gender and armed conflict in April, and then May we have our Cushing Conference, and then in June, we'll um, be looking at the Arctic. The International Society of Military Law and the Law of War is also developing future events. Uh, so please check the Society's uh, webpage and also follow them on LinkedIn for other information. Um, and today's event will be posted next week on the Naval War College YouTube page. So if you um, want to watch it again or you miss something, um, please feel free to log in and you can again find that on the event page uh, for today's event. Thank you again to our first panel um, and, and also to all of you for joining us today. Uh, have a wonderful weekend and I uh, bid you a, a lovely afternoon or evening from a very foggy Newport, Rhode Island. Thanks again and take care.